Hello, welcome to Harry Potter and the story when I visited the set. Misha is here. Lean in, say hello. Hello. Put, put your head in so people can see you. Hello. See, she's here. I am the real Ben Ben. <laughs> as in Ben Ben. As in, I'm really Ben Ben. So I'm really, really, I'm the real, real, real Ben Ben. Stop waffling. <clears throat> Hello, I don't normally do this. I have to, uh, oh, hi, Alpaca. Nice of you to join us. I'm feeling a bit out of sorts because normally I'm the one who just pops in, says something silly and pops off again. I'm not normally the one carrying the stream. But as you can tell this evening, um, we're going to get into some Harry Potter stuff. How has your day been? How's the weekend been? Uh, Misha, you, you can still shout if, if you shout loud enough, people will still hear you. I'm sure they can. If people can't hear me, now is a good time to tell us. You won't be looking at me at the, for the whole time. We will be focusing down on the colouring. Misha, would you like to hold up our colouring sheet? This is Misha's colouring sheet. Hi, Alita. You got it in the living room? Oh dear. Hello, living room. Okay, so this piece of paper is available for free on Discord and anywhere else right now. Uh, yes. Let me type in that command. So we're going to put the, if you don't already have it, uh, we have a command set up for the stream. Uh, welcome Lita's family. I am, well, we won't get into that again. Um, so here is the link to download a free copy of Misha's um, artwork provided by Sarah Kern, our artist. There is a command available for Sarah. If you'd like to see more of her artwork, you can get from Misha's coloring book for more adorable dragons, such as this Harry Potter inspired witch riding a broom, having a good time. Dragon, I yes, I seem so. Fun. I'm not, not, I'm not used to presenting, and I, I feel like I have to be prim and proper and storybook time because right here we have the secrets. You can see I put bookmarks in and things like that. <laughs> now, Misha is going to be my assistant today. I have many pictures, probably too many pictures, uh, to show you. This won't be the only time that we will do this. There is so much material to cover and so many goodies to show you, uh, which I have brought out one uh, to show you this evening. Has everybody got their hot chocolates? Misha has made some hot cocoa, some hot chocolate, mm. some luxurious hot chocolate. Misha, do you want to show them a bit closer the design on your mug? Mm. I'm having hot chocolate in my hot chocolate dragon mug. <laughs> hot, cho who, <laughs> hot chocolate dragon mug with hot chocolate. A hot chocolate hot dragon mug. Anyway. Anyway. <laughs> what do you mean that's so odd? What's, so, what's odd? Me, me being me, like on the spot. Misha's had like two months of practice to this. By the way, is anybody else wearing Harry Potter stuff right now? Because this, on that this, him. this is my serious black that. Azkaban shirt that they gave me. Uh, on, I'll show you the back. <clears throat> Let me just uh, take off this scarf. That's the microphone. Yep, yep. There's the, there's the back. Yeah, yeah. See, see. Real deal. Uh, your mum's cuddling, or is that, or is that supposed to be colouring? <laughs> Hi, Alison. Welcome to the stream. Hopefully, I'm not awful. Please ask questions. This may go better if you do most of the talking. Um, I could do with. I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna borrow the subby jar. Yep. As a little. I am totally in a fantastic beast shirt and all my Harry Potter jewelry. Please share a picture. Uh, put it on Discord or something. Lita's already colouring. Oh, so your mum is colouring, cuddling her colouring. <laughs> Dira, hello. Anyway. Well, you're in bed. That's a good place to be snuggled up. Hopefully with hot chocolate, but don't get any on the hello, sheets. Critical Catalyst, critical catalyst. hello, hello welcome. Uh, yes, thank you for the follow. Thank you for joining us. Let me have a quick sip. <laughs> okay, whenever... <sighs> Sorry, just enjoying the hot chocolate. Meech's made, oh, that feels good inside. It's been kind of cold here today. Uh, we're speaking to you live from Britain, where against all typecast forecasts, it's raining. Or this has been. Story time. It is story time. I have genuine real stories from my visit to the set of Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows. Meech is holding a wand. wand. We will get wand. we will get back to that wand a bit Please later. The story of the wand. Now Misha is going to be colouring. Now because I'm not that exciting to look at in my Gryffindor scarf in my Azkaban shirt, which is a bit, you know, wrong. Unless you know any of the students of Hogwarts who went 
to Azkaban. Trivia question, answer below or to the side, depending which browser version you're using. Who else went to Azkaban who went to Hogwarts? It may have worn both of Hey, no one stealing. <laughs> Otherwise, we may just so happen to have a certain mod swiping in with the Sword of Justice. Okay, so please ask questions. Please get involved, uh, comment away. I'm going to be doing a lot of reading. Amisha's gonna bring up some pictures. Now, I've got to set the scene for, because people will inevitably ask, how is it, Ben, or Ben Ben, that you got involved in Harry Potter? And I'll go, well, it involved a lot of bribery. No, it didn't. It involved, I had to put you up on my TV. I'm on your TV? Let me out! <clears throat> I should, probably shouldn't try and make Misha laugh, because she will then go, all the hot chocolate as she splurts all over a colouring page. Uh, Heather loves you. I drew, you did draw her. Misha absolutely loves the fact that you gave her one tooth. So she's like, oh! I'm sure she doesn't sound like that, but it's an absolutely adorable picture. Oh golly. Oh, I didn't even get an oh Ben. I got an oh golly. Okay, so context was, um, Misha, do you want to um, start the, the camera down at the colouring page so we can see the colouring so you don't have to see me? There you go. So this is what Misha's going to be colouring, so... Yes, I'll start coloring while Ben's tell, telling stories. The challenge is on. And then um, I will be showing some photos whenever Ben tells me to. So you can get to see them on the screen rather than, you know, me holding up a phone. Oh, anyway. <laughs> I'm pretty sure they can hear me. That microphone's no, but, quite good. Yeah, but not when you're turning the other way. Oh, anyway. Anyway. <clears throat> There's been... What? What do you mean, Ben Ben 600? <laughs> Nothing's happened. Okay, so the context was, I am a cancer survivor. Don't worry, I'm not putting a dire edge on things. I am perfectly fine, as, as fine as uh, you know me at least anyway. I'm in, I'm in good health, uh, I am cancer free. But uh, the story begins a long time ago in a galaxy close, close to home. <laughs> in a town called Newcastle under Lyme, uh, there lived a certain young single man, this was before I met Misha, uh, who, um, Basically got cancer. Hodgkin's lymphoma. Oh, don't cry. No, no, it's absolutely fine. Absolutely fine. I actually viewed having cancer like having a broken arm because it was a very curable type of cancer. Uh, although, Harry Potter related trivia fact, uh, Richard... I'm going to get the wrong Richard now. Uh, not Griffiths. Richard. The, the first Dumbledore. Please let me know his Richard surname. Harris. What? Not Richard Harris. Richard Harris. You yeah, know, I think it was actually. Richard Harris died of this actual cancer. It affects people under the age of 25 and over 65, uh, more males than females. Uh, so anyway, the point was is I had this cancer and one of the charitable foundations, like Make-A-Wish Foundation, they reach out and say, hey peeps, what do you, you want to do? You know, cheer yourself up. Because, you know, uh, it affects you in different ways sometimes and I was pretty much fine, but it kind of takes out, you have to come out of work and all the rest of it. And so I was like in uh, university at the time studying Film, television, and radio studies. I eventually did graduate from that course. The second year was when it all was kind of kicking off with the treatment, and I was uh, hoping with my classmates to go to a studio, maybe somewhere, uh, not like a universal studio, but like an actual sort of working film studio that could go and see. Um, so I think there might have been one in Chicago area or in sort of East Coast America that we thought we would go to, but it would have been like £600 a person, so that never really took off, and the university wasn't really organising anything. Oh, I'm very, I'm very thankful that there's, there's still a real Ben Ben and not a fake or memory of Ben Ben. That would be kind of awkward right now, because um, then it would have to be the real Misha, the real Mish Mish, talking to you. And so they... They said, hey, you know, give us your first choice, your second choice, third choice. And the choices were all kind of, well, they were fine, but they were like, have a chef come cook you a nice meal, like a three course meal, or go to the London Eye, and that's a big like uh, Ferris wheel you may have seen in the city of London, or have a balloon, hot air balloon ride, go to Alton Towers, that's a big theme park here. And I didn't really like it, so I was like, I want to go to a film studio. So I thought, well, what films are kind of filming right now? And I thought, well, Harry Potter's filming. Uh, you know, Bond wasn't or anything like that, Star Wars uh, wasn't, this was in 2009, uh, some sort of um, summer of 2009 or just before, and I thought, yeah, I'll put it down, and uh, I sent the letter in, the charity wrote back and said, 
<clears throat> this isn't really going to happen. Uh, in fact, I think they gave me a phone call. Oh, thank you very much for the follow. Who was that? I didn't see that. Was that Critical Catalyst? Or is it not coming up? I'm, Misha's looking at her OBS and I'm not seeing it, so I have to be the voice. And they said, hey, look, we're not going to, you're not going to get into see Harry Potter. Uh, the reason being is they are a working studio and none of the studios in Britain uh, accept visitors. But this is why we were actually looking at going to America for the first point. Could you post the link to the colouring page again? Yes, if you do command colour with a U because we're British. Oh, but, oh, look at that. Misha is bilingual tonight. Random down, that random down. Thank you for the follow. Oh, I think uh, Lita's posted a picture of everybody wearing their Fantastic Beasts stuff in Discord. If you aren't a member of our Discord community, have a look. Fantastic Beasts shirt. Dang, that does look pretty cool. I'm on TV! Hello, dog. I can see a dog. Have you got so Oh, no. Mama Lita's got ice pack on her ankle still. Well, I hope that ice tastes nice in a drink. They don't, don't recycle it. That's not a good idea. Okay, anyway, switching back. Got to enable this here. So um, they said, no, look, we're going to go with your second choice. Six months passed, and I literally hadn't heard a peep out of them. So I thought, mm, whatever, you know. And I was getting better. My treatment had finished, and um, I was starting to slowly return to normality in terms of having a job, going to church, uh, university, uh, was heading into its third year. And suddenly I get a call and it basically went like this. Hey, um, yeah, Leaveston Studios have, have made you their one exception all year. Um, here's a date in, I think it was November of 2009. Uh, bring a responsible adult and we'll send you the address. And I was like, say what? <clears throat> Can you imagine? That was basically, let's think about it now. That was basically my acceptance letter to Hogwarts because I did eventually get a letter confirming all this. And uh, the foundation was called the Willow Foundation, and uh, it's run by the Wilson family in Hatfield, Hertfordshire. Uh, hello, Alice! Thank you for coming. Hope you're doing well. Basically, you've uh, just missed me explaining the context, which was, I, weren't a, I, I wasn't a response. Am I a responsible adult, though? No. Thanks, Misha. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, I'm just going to have a quick sip of my hot chocolate. Hope everyone's got theirs. Any, anybody not got hot chocolate? Misha telling me not to waffle. Uh, this is what happens. Uh, she's telling me to shut. She's mouthing shut up at me. Basically, I'm kind of new to this whole Twitch thing. I only really come in in hers as a supporting cast, like minions in the Despicable Mummy films. You don't have hot chocolate? I suggest you procure a hot chocolate. Have hot chocolate. Hot chocolates are good. Anyways, so I um, had to find a response for adult because A, I didn't have a car. I didn't. Uh, did I have a car? I can't remember. Basically, I needed somebody to come with me. Now, that presented a real problem because who do I ask? I can't tell anybody. It's a big thing. Like, although if word got out that they were letting, you know, a recovering person into the site, suddenly there'd be all sorts of people, Harry Potter nerds everywhere would want to get in, or locals, for example. Local officials would want to get in. Hello, Pink Bubbles. Welcome. Uh, Angie, good to see that you made a little hot cocoa. Crystal's got three cups of coffee, that's overdoing it slightly, but you know, there you go. So I couldn't ask uh, my older sister per se because she had two kids at the time. Uh, I couldn't ask my little sister. She was... Not quite the adult. <laughs> no, and she also didn't have a driving license. Uh, no, I, I didn't have Misha who has a driving license but would die on the roads of Britain according to her own words. And my parents, well, my dad would have to take a day off work. My mum wouldn't really appreciate it. She also didn't have a car. And so dad would still have to have sorted out. Car. You know, so my options were limited. So if I was to ask one sibling or family member, it would be a case of why didn't you pick me? So I picked my brother-in-law, Matt, who is Ginger. Uh, and I say that because he was really excited when I asked him because he was a Harry Potter nerd because my little sister got him into it. So eventually... When she did find out, like, a year later or something, she lost her head because she's like, I got you into Harry Potter, why did you pick me? She had a Ron shrine, like, genuinely, like a little shrine in her room to Ron. Anybody else have any, like, shrines that they've secretly been harboring for Ron or Neville 
or anybody else that you sort of had a secret crush for. All the nerds unite. Yes! Strike down the Sword of Justice. So, uh, let's turn some pages here. Yeah. Oh, Did you uh, get Mark going down? Yes, that's going to be part of the story. She didn't know at the time. No, this is the thing. I couldn't tell anybody. The only person I did tell, thank you for that host. Who was that hosting from? Crochet Dude. Crochet Dude. Thank you for the host. That's very kind. Uh, didn't he have to sign an NDA to get yeah, an NDA for those people who don't know is a non-disclosure agreement I'm pretty sure I probably did have to sign a non-disclosure agreement um, It's an important thing. That's where you agree to tell people nothing like you can't tell people anything uh, Thank you. I think that was a host from Crystal. I didn't have a shrine, but I was a big Snape fan See I was not a Snape fan because that was kind of the point wasn't it? Snape was supposed to be the character who everybody hated and then ended up turning out you had to Hashtag spoilers. Um, not hate, shall we say, just in case you've not read the books or seen the films. Hmm, that's nice. Uh, hello, hello, crochet dude. So, fast forward. So, we are now in the month of October 2009. Uh, let's just get this right. Coincidentally, um, Misha had actually just arrived into the country. Fun fact. Misha doesn't want me to share that story. <laughs> Moving along. Yeah, well, I've got to, I've got to set the, the scene for why I'm going, who I'm going with, because that kind of ties into the whole trip to Leaveston Studios. Leaveston Studios uh, is the current studios for Fantastic Beasts and where to find them. If you actually go on Apple Maps or Google Maps right now, then you will see that. Misha, could you bring up for us, please, on the laptop, the... Right. What? What, Crystal? You can't just say what? <laughs> okay, we're going to be switching now completely, so you'll just be um, seeing our desktop screen. Just for a little bit. Just for a little bit. Yes. So if you can bring up. Take a lot of moving around. Yes. Okay. Don't mind the fact that you've got like a hundred pictures of the same screen. That's how it works. Okay. So what are we doing? Which one? We want the Apple Maps app. Apple Maps. So. Here you go. This is Leaveston Studios near Watford in England, just outside of London. Why won't Misha let you tell that story? I guess she doesn't like it or finds it irrelevant and that I'm waffling or it something or other. It is irrelevant. It is. It's completely irrelevant, <laughs> but that's what we do on the stream. We just go off on tangents. Please ask and go off on tangents and things. So here is Leaveston Studios. If you just pinch out a little bit, dear. This is how it is today. So you can see there are two red pins. The first one over the warehouses is the real studios. Uh, but stories are fun. They are fun. We will have to talk about them another time because we will do more Harry Potter streams because there's that much going on. So the red pin with the, the warehouses is part of the main studio complex that existed when Harry Potter was uh, being shot. The red pin in the car park below and the warehouse sort of space next to that was a recent addition when they opened the studio tour. It used to be simply grassland and overflow parking. So, I have uh, taken a picture of, but I don't think I've sent you a picture, do you? Have I? Of the, um, the map. So, uh, give me a moment. So, um, let me bring that up. That would be called organization, people. You can do it through iMessage, it's please, and I can pull it up on the laptop. Absolutely. Because that's what prepared streamers do as they prepare in events, which we did do, just, you know, lots of elements of it. So Misha will eventually bring up a picture of the map that I had from security for getting in. So part of the adventure down to Leibson Studios then uh, started on Tuesday, the 20th of October, 2009. <clears throat> I'm now going to read to you from my journal. Please ask questions. Please uh, let me know if you don't understand anything or if you want extra details. I'm quite happy to discuss them. So once I'd managed to get my uh, brother-in-law, he'd got himself the day off. I didn't have any work to get any days off from at the time. Um, we uh, were able to go down the night before and stay in a hotel that was arranged from this charity, the Willow Foundation. So my journal reads, so... After some stressed confusion over whether Matt could come with me because he might be starting his new job, open brackets, that's now resolved. Um, I had a half day at uni and then Matt, my brother-in-law, and I took his car down to Watford. Now Watford, 
for reference from where I live, uh, is about mm, two and a half to three hours drive. Here is the site coming up on the screen of how the site looked at the time. I'm just refreshing my Twitch here so that I can see what you're seeing at the same time. Now, only my mum and my sister Abby, who obviously is married to my brother-in-law, knew where we were going. I felt it was kind of important for them to know where we were actually going to be, so they had to also keep it quiet. Now, some others knew that we were just going somewhere, but not where. But that was their problem. Can I get rid of this Apple Maps? Yes, you may for now. Min minimise it, if you would. Thank you very much. Okay. Now, we both felt happy and giddy going down on this trip because, let's face it, how would you feel, guys, if you got into a car together and realised you're about to visit the set of Harry Potter and nobody else is visiting, which we will also come back to. Like, you can't get in if you ask, apparently, unless you get cancer or uh, actually work on the film. Leaveston is located outside of Watford. It's a small sort of residential quiet area. There's literally nothing else going on. Fun fact, Star Wars Episode One: The Phantom Menace was, I think, the first film to actually shoot here in 1997. So here it is. Have a look. So you can see the main entry at the bottom right-hand corner of the map from... It's not even a main road. It's just a road. You'd come in to the security gate and go around. You can see the main complex. Have a look at some of the detail, zoom in if you can, or go closer to your TV screen to look at some of the fun places which we will revisit later in the stream. So imagine how you felt. I mean, Alice, absolutely, I agree. I would die. I think we were both very good. We were excited to see all sorts. We hadn't really been told what we would see. Um, all I had said to the producer's assistant, who I had been liaising with, was that I was a film student. And so I was interested in other parts of the production that perhaps they wouldn't show, for example, family members of the cast and crew who came to visit. They had been filming for nigh on a decade at this point, so the atmosphere on set was very welcoming to people who did come, but you didn't really get external visitors who weren't related to the production. So Matt and I were comparing it to kids going to the chocolate factory because we were like... <laughs> What if we see this? What, what oh, do you think this is like? Do you think we'll get a one? Do you think we'll see Quidditch? Do you think we'll see this person or that person? We didn't really know what was going on, other than that we might see certain types of departments, like the art department and the set. So we kept talking about what we'd love to see and what chances were of seeing good or bad things. Like, would we see something that's kind of boring, like, I don't know, the producer's office, for example. Paper pushers, the photocopier room. Things like that. So, uh, it took us a while to get there. Now this, bearing in mind, 2009 was only three years after the iPhone was launched. Did I get a wand? Yes, I did. <laughs> uh, it was, uh, it's on the table and we will show you the wand again before the end of the stream. And I will explain to you how I got the wand because that's kind of cool as well. And I'm just going to have a sip of this warm chocolate. Does everybody like the Harry Potter music in the background, by the way? Especially chosen for tonight. Um, I have all eight Harry Potter soundtracks. Uh, I do like tracks from just about all of them, really. Um, that laugh. Yes, I have laughs. Not quite giggles the same way that Misha does, but, uh, you know, there you go. Now, we stayed in the Hilton Hotel, but we needed Matt's iPhone to get us there. Bearing in mind, again, only three years after the iPhone came out, I didn't have one, hardly anybody did because they were expensive and they, they hadn't really, I guess, caught on. So it was an iPhone 3GS, you know, back in the chunky days when screens were only three and a half inches compared to today's like 10 million pixels. Seriously, child in a candy shop. Yes, seriously. <laughs> now, I'd never stayed in a, in a Hilton. Has anybody stayed in a Hilton? Because I hadn't. I hadn't stayed hardly in any hotels ever. So this was kind of like, not only did I get to go to the set, I got to stay in a hotel. And not just a hotel, but a Hilton. Not like a big fancy Hilton, but kind of like a, you know, London Hilton, whatever, just outside of London thing. So Matt was used to it, I wasn't. And I remember going up to the desk to check in and they're like, would you like a wake up call or a newspaper? And I was like, uh, do I? I thought that was something that only really happened in films, you know, people in fancy places. So it was all very posh, I thought. And there was a Costco right opposite. So um, we're, uh, 
having fun. And we did. We, we had McDonald's to eat. And the next day, we got out... Uh, sorry, the night before, actually. Here's something nerdy. We decided to stay in and watch Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince. Uh, uh, in the hotel's, uh, you know, TV thing. So that was appropriate, I thought. I mean, how would you prepare, mentally? You're there the night before. You know you're just a few miles away from Leaves and Studios. What would you do? So... After sharing the morning, having a full English breakfast, we left early, and as sensible people do, we decided to, you know, give us ourselves the extra time. Now, the charity had given us the address to go to, and the time that we had to be at the security gate. I remember it was 10 a.m. We had to be there. Uh, we were told that we couldn't have photos. You know, security, like the fact that you weren't supposed to be there in the first place, you couldn't take photos. But I'd taken the camera, just in case. But the, uh, the charity had given us the postcode for their P.O. box, their postal box. So we turned up, and it was a Royal Mail warehouse factory. I'm like, mm, now, unless the production company is being all secretive, like behind this fake facade, I don't think this is where it is. So, uh, Misha, could you at this point switch to um, the exterior picture of Leavesden Studios taken from uh, my phone, please. It is on the top, there it is, yep. Okay, so this is a view from the side parking at Leavesden Studios uh, from the time. Uh, taken rather sneakily, uh, because, you know, yeah, didn't want to be kicked out. Hundreds of people watching. There was actually probably between six and eight hundred people working on set because it's a huge facility. It used to be a Royal Rolls Royce engine factory for airplanes or something, and then it used to be a paint factory as well. So that's uh, that's it, and they just put this nice sort of leaves and branding on the side of it. So we had to use Matt's iPhone again because the sat nav was not being helpful at all. So I was like, "Oh, iPhones, lifesaver." So that was, uh, that was an experience for me. I was like, oh, this is what an iPhone can do. Oh, nine years ago, how we, how we love it. So I was sort of mentally willing Matt to break the speed limit so we could catch up with the fact that we were late. Now Angie, who was the producer's assistant, who I'd been liaising with, um, was gonna be a bit rushed because, <coughs> you know, they're still filming. They had been filming The Deathly Hallows for a little bit by now. Uh, because they were filming both films back to back, kind of like Lord of the Rings, um, I didn't want to have an annoyed production assistant who's like, oh, I've got these people who shouldn't even be here turning up late, um, sort of thing. So um, we did get there five minutes late, uh, just about, and once security led us through, and we sort of had to wait for a little bit, they gave us our passes. Guys, can you imagine what it's like being handed a pass, if only for a day, about being let in to Leaves and Studios, basically, like, Getting, going through platform nine and three quarters, the gate at platform nine and three quarters. Uh, Misha, how would you feel about that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's basically what it felt like. Now, in later streams, I will come back to my experience coming back to Leaveson Studios to do more work. And uh, guys, I can tell you that feeling of going through the security gate uh, was just like, oh, did I get to keep the pass? No, they made me surrender it. Uh, so before I left, I did take a picture uh, of the front and back so I could show that I'd been a contractor, uh, which we, we will show. Uh, now, Misha, if you can bring the map back up, please. Which one? Uh, sorry, the, the printed map. Oh. Uh... I messaged, wasn't it? Or did you? There it is. Oh, that, that'll do. Okay, so we entered from the... Right hand side, you see the road that says South Way. So we kind of ended it from the back and came across to the main big building. I mean, if you could zoom into that sort of big building to the bottom side of it. Whoa. <laughs> Rotate round. Uh, uh, yeah, getting closer. This one right here? No, no, the, the big one at the bottom. That's it, keep going down. Yep. That corner. Okay, so just leave it there for a minute. Okay, so what you're looking at here in the bottom right hand side is the canteen area. And on the top right hand side is the production offices, some general stages across that sort of row of ridges, the big ridges across the top. On the sort of western side there you have 
uh, stage G, I think it was, which is where I spent a lot of my time when I came back to work. And they actually knocked through the building to extend it because the set, which they needed, which was the Ministry of Magic set for the Polyjuice Potion Courtroom Corridor Chase. I'm sure there was a name for it, like scene 89 or something. Uh, the set didn't quite fit, so they just knocked through the side of the building, as they did. And they were renting the building. They didn't own the building until after the production wrapped, and they decided, you know what, we're going to buy this studio, like Warner Brothers. And then that's when it got renamed, technically, like Warner Brothers Studios, whatever. Anywho, so let's get into the actual magic. So, fortunately, when we arrived, and thank you for bearing with me, uh, we arrived and we found Angie, the producer's assistant, smiling, waiting, and you know, that's nice. I'd always sort of seen behind the scenes DVDs of like uh, James Cameron films and everybody was always being mean, shouting at each other, looking rushed, whatever. This wasn't what I experienced. So we drove along to, to Angie um, and it, it transpired come the end of the day that she was just only too happy to spend time taking us around and she really didn't want to do what was in her in train, like her inbox. So she was kind of the opposite of what I'd imagined. Now. First of all, I started to recognize names on the reserved car park spaces, such as David Yates. And David Yates was the director of, can you name them all? The Deathly Hallows, Deathly Hallows Part 2, The Half-Blood Prince, The Order of the Phoenix, and what should be the complete Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them um, series. Uh, Misha, if you want to minimize and return to OBS and show that the progress that you're making with your dragon, We'll come back to some of these photos in a minute. <laughs> How's everybody doing with their colouring in? Have you gotten as far as Misha has with her colouring in? I can tell you I have not coloured in anything because that's a level of multitasking I don't possess. Do you like that vortex that we've got going on right now? Cool. Ah, hot chocolate. Here you go, Misha, do you want to kind of rotate that up? <laughs> Get a little purple and orange going on there. What colours are you going to do? Um, I don't know yet. I'll decide as I go along. But yeah. Colour the hat in. <laughs> what colouring? <laughs> Crystal. She's like, I'm too enraptured. Well, it needs to be um, an amazing hat, Take doesn't that. it? On an amazing hat stream. Oh yes, Alice, you can, you can, uh, listening intently. You can get this uh, free colouring page. Right here, and I bought, just pulled up the link for you. Right here. Ah, another. <laughs> <clears throat> I also, um, quickly... You have a purple hat too? See, that's the thing. Purple, as it, part of the film vernacular, tends to be for strange, rich, or unique people. <laughs> Think about that, especially for Disney films. And if you are interested, um, I actually do have a coloring book. You can get it off Amazon. Um, and it's single-sided, because I like single-sided ones. Um, you can also um, go to my website and get the digital version. You can print it off as many times as you want. But yeah, that's from our, our coloring book. And that is from a resident artist, Sarah, who is, we prefer eccentric. What, eccentric as in people or colors? Very eccentric, yeah. The wing, boom, bristles, awesome. And the tail, whoa, you're quick. Unless it's all the same colour, in which case, is that cheating? Or yeah. is that just smart? Purple hat, wow, we got purple going all over the place, of guys. Of course, it's Halloween. Strange, it's definite strange. Or is it <laughs> Doctor Strange? They are the best colouring books. Oh yes, Crystal got some. She got both, you got both actually, didn't you? She did. I believe Misha is actually working on a third colouring book. I've seen some of the, uh, the artwork. We are, we are working on a third one. So, anyway, back to the story because that's what you've come for and I appreciate that you've come to listen. So, I recognise the reserved parking spaces for David Yates, the director, David Heyman, the producer, and John Tre Trehe. And I can't remember what he did. Anybody wants to look up John Trehe? It's T-R-E-H-E-Y. I feel he must have been like a executive producer or something. Did you find a button, Alpaca asks? Oh, Alpaca, um, not yet. I will get one out though. Don't worry. Don't worry. We will button you up. <laughs> Alice says, I might have to colour it tomorrow, lol. Mostly because my tablet is packed when I don't feel like taking it out. That's all right. Take That's your right. tablets. Tablets are very important. <laughs> Take them with plenty of water and make sure you eat meals beforehand if the medicine requires you to. Lols. Now, 
To our great surprise, Angie told us that we could in fact take photos as long as she approved them and held onto the camera when we weren't using them. So I was suddenly like, oh, you know, like the Dementor music from the Prisoner of Azkaban. Anyway, so um, she had to hold onto the camera the whole day. Uh, so we couldn't just like take sneaky photos because I totally wouldn't have taken sneaky photos. I wouldn't have shared them online. Remember, Facebook was like a year old at this point. Twitter, I can't even remember. YouTube was not owned by Google. Producer. Ah, producer. Ah, thank you very much. Good thing you bought the company. Yeah, the thing is my camera, I think must have been like a five megapixel camera. Um, it was a little bit grainy, but we'll show you some of the pictures. Um, so let's go inside the Hogwarts sets. Now, having uh, signed some health and safety forms, we were off. Uh, the first stop was the art department. Now, I have a couple of pictures. Some of the pictures that I'm going to show you today are not from this trip because I couldn't take all the pictures. So I've found the next best thing or pictures of what I think are the same things from when we went back three years ago and did the studio tour. So Misha, if I could just pause your colouring, sorry. Yep, no problem. And uh, we're going to screen share again. Uh, we're going to bring up the picture of the... I'm, I'm, I'm going to stretch across the uh, distance here. Uh, where is it? You know, you've got the plants, you've got the, 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 the spider. I think I didn't get that picture off. Um, there was a picture... Uh, oh, what's that one in the centre? Image 0041. This one. Yeah, we'll have that up for now. That'll kind of do. Now, sorry to spoil some of the magic, guys, but... Hogwarts isn't actually kind of real. <laughs> like it is, but it's also not. Because here's a picture taken of the Grand Hall side entrance. And you can see the back of the plastering, the rigging, the pipes, the cables. So this is one of the things that impressed me about the set is inside the sets you totally felt you were in a castle. No, shh, no, don't freak out, guys. It's okay. <laughs> Sip your hot chocolate. I think I just destroyed the chat and everybody's dreams. I think people are gonna like shun me forever. It's it's real. <laughs> my eyes, my eyes. Well, it's okay, guys, because it still exists. You can still go there. Hogwarts is actually a real location that you can visit in the other Newcastle up up north. Um, where they did film for Harry Potter 1 and 2, the exteriors, and also different locations, but the interiors, of course, were a fabrication on, on set. So we went around the art department. Now, normally they wouldn't take visitors around the art department because I was a film student, and I was like, I want to see the art department! I probably said it in that voice as well. Um, now, because they were um, shooting parts 1 and 2 concurrently, they still had storyboard artists still storyboarding the film halfway through production! Why do you have to destroy our dreams? I'm going to conveniently not answer that question. Um, now, for anybody who has any concept of film production, normally you storyboard everything, then you shoot everything, and then you put it all together. So the fact that they were halfway through filming, and they were shooting scenes not necessarily in sequential order, but just, you know, when actors were available and stuff, they were still storyboarding Literally, as they were going, if I ever get married, it's going to happen in the Great Hall. No discussion in the end. Well, you know, fun fact, Alpaca, you can have a Christmas meal on Christmas Day for £150 in the Great Hall. So maybe they will let you get married. That would be amazing. Although I've never seen pictures of people getting married in the Great Hall. Maybe no one's asked. Ask them. You go for it. Um, I, I'd, I'd be happily happy to come along. Um, congratulations also if you're engaged, which I don't think you are, but, you know, work on that if you're not. The, the fun thing was is they have storyboards up on huge sheets. If you can imagine something that's as big as a person and they have essentially photograph-sized pieces of paper with storyboards on, you can look them up online for just about any film. Well, thank you for the invitation. <coughs> that would be very nice. So we're walking through and now remember, this is a film that has not been released and people don't just go sharing, um, you know, this kind of art. And we're walking past these large, 
think of it like a comic strip of uh, pictures of these sequences that they have not shot. And I'm like walking past them going, trying to quickly look at them to absorb as much information. I mean, basically you feel like a bank robber with your eyes because you're trying to absorb all this information. Thank you to whatever just happened. What happened? I can't tell. Something just happened. <laughs> whatever it is, thank you for the like, the follow, the sub subscribe, share. <clears throat> that, yes. Excuse me. So, we walked past all these big storyboards. And I was like, ooh, that looks like battle stuff. Because there was a lot of battle in part two. Um, now, we also went into a little room where this one guy was essentially working in a, what I would describe as a square studio space where he had literally the walls covered with paintings that presumably he himself, Thanks Ellen, had done. Follow, Alice. Alice followed. Thank you so much for following. You're not really here for me. You're here for Misha. <laughs> uh, now, Misha, if you could close this picture, mm -hmm. we're going to show you uh, a piece of art that I found online today. It is um, bottom right. No, not bottom right. Sorry. Um, it's the courtyard painting. Um, sorry guys, I'm looking at it from a distance. Uh, bottom left corner, bottom left, bottom left. All the way at the bottom left, that one. So here is some artwork that I took from the set visit years later. So they had artists basically just painting out key scenes and this guy was still working on stuff. Now one of the things that I saw in his office that um, was happening, now I hadn't read, I don't think I'd read the book at this point, or had I? No, I must have. I read. I had read the book, so I knew how it ended. On the wall, there was a painting of... They'd taken a screenshot of the scene where Ron and Hermione go into the Chamber of Secrets to get the Basilisk Tooks. Now, you could tell that they'd shot a green screen, and the, it was the, uh, essentially the beginning shot uh, from that sequence... <coughs> excuse me. Where you can see everybody. Uh, the basilisk upside down dead hollowed out and uh, Ron and Hermione standing there and he sort of painted around it and I thought oh that's so cool because I was wondering would they show that because sometimes in films these quick other things that happen like for example um, the the headless hunting party from the Chamber of Secrets gets cut out or spew from the Goblet of Fire gets cut out I'm trying to show off my uh, Harry Potter trivia here and anybody else feeling nerdy right now? And I thought, would that be a part of the sequence that wouldn't get shown because you'd have to rebuild the whole set, I thought. But as it happened, they green screened it and reused the footage from the Chamber of Secrets <coughs> or sort of recreated some of it digitally based on the, the filming they did on the Chamber of Secrets. So I thought, that's so cool. They are actually having that sequence in the film. But I couldn't tell anybody. <sighs> the pressure, guys. The pressure. Anyways, so go, go, bon, bon, go, bon, bon. Oh, you, <laughs> you mean Ben Ben? Mm -hmm. Or as Becca once said, Beneb, was it, well, wasn't it Beneb? It got wrong. Now, so the story artist um, was currently working on the final battle. Now he was working on a piece of paper and he said that using Photoshop only made him zoom in. Uh, sorry, he, he only used Photoshop to zoom in and work on the less important details. Now he had a pretty big graphics tablet. Now at the time I'd only seen real small, um, Tablets, I'm, I'm using my hands as if you can see me, but you can't. Um, let me, you can close that for a moment. You can show back your, your dragon again. On OBS, thank you very much, my lovely assistant. And she is, she is lovely. Ooh. I believe that's called a, there's a special effect when you can see a screen within a screen within a screen. Uh, I'm just like, really low. oh yeah, so I'm saying that the graphics tablet that I'd only experienced was like the consumer tablets that were like 50 pounds back in the day. Now, whereas these days, you can have an iPad with an iPad uh, Apple Pencil quite easily for like uh, 50, 60 pounds with a tablet that's bigger than that. He had like a graphics tablet that was, you know, I'm trying, you know, like much bigger, almost like a piece of A3 paper, I'd say. Screen inception. Yes, that's not the official term for it. I think there is a scientific term for it, like Newton's screen or, you know, something clever like that. Maybe somebody could look it up. I wouldn't know how to describe it, though. Uh, Misha's uh, colouring in some, some blue. What's the blue? Tummy stripes. Tummy stripes are blue. Blue and orange. Good contrast. Opposite colours make for good contrasts. Colouring tip for the day. Um, now, this is where my nerds started kicking in. Um, the storyboards were organised by cut and continuous markers. So, like, 
you can have, for example, one shot that doesn't move. Like for example, this webcam is not moving. So it is a continuous image. But if different things are happening, like Misha's hands moving around and you want to display those in storyboards, you need to therefore have several storyboards to represent the same shot happening. And they'd have those words um, you know, on those storyboards to re represent how they were going to edit it later. Being an editor, you know, that was a big deal for me. Now, seeing the, the graphic design concept rooms um, next door, there was, I would say, uh, four computers pushed together in pairs and then another two on the other side. And this art room, oh my goodness, guys, it was like, it probably wasn't much bigger than the room we were in. Uh, you know, a little, a little bigger, but not like a huge room or anything. And people were like on a table like this, a couple computers, and they were, <coughs> for the day, impressive. They were all using 24 inch IMAX. Harry Potter use it, what? Never mind. we'll just leave it as it's magical. What's magical? Oh, oh, I see the, the screen inception. Um, 24 inch IMAX. Now, I got to <laughs> hold and browse a copy of The Daily Prophet, like complete with blue screen tracking markers because you know like pictures in Harry Potter move. And so they don't always print the pictures. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. And so where the pictures were, there was just a blue square or rectangle so that you could see later, you know, they'd, they'd track, they'd add the elements in later. I also got to handle a, an edition of the Quibbler. That is Luna Lovegood. You know, somebody loved Luna, I think it was Lita. Lita. There you go. Um, so I got to hold the Quibbler, which was completely crazy, full of colorful, sparkly details. Hi, Liz. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, hi, Liz. You're in a lunch break. Hello. Oh, I don't know how many she talks for so long, it hurts your throat. Uh, just talking about how I'm in the art room right now, Liz. I got to hold the Quibbler, the Daily Prophet. Everybody's using pretty IMAX that I wanted. Um, everybody was sh on a shared server storage unit. And they were all just designing things. Again, halfway through production and they were still designing things. Uh, that does, that's not to say that they weren't organized, it's just that's how they were organized. Now, I also got to hold a copy of the Tales of Beedle the Bard. Now, I have a copy of the consumer book, of course, but in the film they have that special version that Hermione sort of reads out and Ron's like, I remember it being at sunset. Was it sunset, he says? And like they argue over that point in the, the story, how, how it was told. Uh, now, the, cool th the really cool thing that I really remember was the Marauder's Map. Now, I know that you can buy, and there are friends that we have who have a copy of the Marauder's Map. Um, it is quite simply, in my opinion, the most magical thing that you could ask for from the Harry Potter world. Absolutely, this is where we're going to... Now here is a picture of the Marauder's map that Misha's going to pull up, of the genuine deal, not one that you can buy from shops, um, that I got to handle. Uh, now Misha, if you could make it full screen for me, please. That's alright, yeah, click that, and then the icon on the top left, the one... Top left here, that one. That's it. Okay, <clears throat> this is the Marauders map that they use on the film. Now you can see just how many layers to it and the sheer amount of detail. So all these artists were complete nerds and awesome designers. You can see some of the other things at the bottom of the image that they have illustrated. This is on display in the studio tour. If you go, I highly recommend it. We spent six hours there. Uh, absolutely lovely. Now Misha, could you use the, the trackpad to zoom in, in towards the top left corner we can see one of the flaps with the staircase, please. Now this is one of the details that perhaps you, you've never noticed on the film. So not only can you see all the wonderful details and the, the sort of Latin words and the columns of castle struck, you know, so castles are made with columns. You can see some of those printed. Now you can see on this flap that the staircase has actually somehow been folded. This is like, book folding, but on a micro level, that staircase is 3D. Somebody has actually done that. Um, and believe me, it was amazing just to pick up, like when I picked it up, it was all folded. So I got to unfold it and just nose around all these different rooms that you've never seen. And I think even the books you've never really even seen. And then just be like, and the, you know, some of the artists were showing, you're like, oh look, you can like over here and like, look, look at this staircase. Like they were kind of geeking out about it as well. You know, they, they were having a good time doing what they're doing. 
it's considering that most film productions only last perhaps for example star wars when they shoot they shoot for 30 days that quite intense steven spielberg might shoot for no more than 60 days um uh, Misha, maybe if you move the image over to another part so people can have a closer look up. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, you know, so they'd been working. Up here up top. Sure. Look at that. There you go. So you can just see the sheer amount of detail and artistry that goes into just one prop. And you don't even get to see it that close because sometimes it's been replaced in the computer. So you can see all the markings around the edge of the map. Uh, so it was just delightful just to be in the art room, just picking up all these things. Now, the art room was quite literally, lit. like, if you imagine like somebody's creative, crafty room studio and you've got like things upon the walls, pictures, you've got things on desks, you've got things on things. So for example, like for all the films that had happened up to this point, you have all the leaflets, the handouts, the flyers, the Ministry of Magic reports, the books, the collectibles, um, party dangly things, absolutely everything um, is just all over this room. They've set it up to look good and it's also stuff that they're working on. So one of the things that I saw was, again spoilers, uh, take a sip of hot chocolate to moisten your throat. I actually run out of hot chocolate so I'm going to have some of this <coughs> other stuff. Ah, oh, is obviously better at this than I am. Um, I saw, again spoilers, but I think you've all seen it, uh, Dobby's gravestone but an earlier version of it. I believe in the finished film it has a, a certain squarish kind of look. Uh, Harry in the book and in the film makes the grave himself and so he would have been able to use a certain type of stone that was laying around the beach to make the gravestone. The initial design for the gravestone uh, was kind of more spherical-ish, like kind of oblong-ish and you know, engraved. The and you know, it said, you know, here lies Dobby, a free elf, or I think words to that effect. <clears throat> now, the artist revealed that um, when kids, for example, of the production staff or whatever came through, who hadn't read the books, and they were like, Dobby dies? They were like, no, 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 it's fine, we're just, you know, messing around, doing whatever. They had, you know, I think they upset a couple of kids. So um, <laughs> when I saw it, they were like, have you, have you, read, the, you, know, have you, have you read the books? I'm like, oh, it's fine, it's fine, I read the books. So, you know, that was, I mean, you you, uh, you see it at the end of part one, don't you? That's how the end of part one ends. Now, this is the thing. At the time, nobody knew where the split was. There was a lot of speculation. If you cast your minds back, nobody knew where the split in part one and two would occur. There wasn't a very obvious place to split the book because if you have the book, it, um, uh, oh, Misha, you can take that picture off. No, thank you, by the way. Yeah, if you take it back to the camera for a second. It's kind of sad, it was hard enough reading after reading the book. Oh, I know, right? Poor Dobby. Uh, if you bring up the camera again, we're just going to use this as an illustration. Now, I have here my copy, the English copy, of Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, which, fun fact, Misha has never read. Because, because, in all fairness, she has got all the books and she's read the first six. However, in the run-up to the seventh book, which was coming out just before uh, film five was coming out, The Order of the Phoenix. It was everywhere because it was basically climaxing. Now, it was running on Misha's TV with her roommates uh, on their TV station every day. They had it on every day. Misha had pre-ordered the book and I've seen the book in her Amazon package in America. It's still in its Amazon packaging. She's never read it because- I'm so sick of it. She was just sick of it being on all <laughs> the time. They overdid so it. Her sick. roommates killed it for her. So she has not read The Deathly Hallows. No, I should probably go back and read them all again, really. I would like to reread the whole series. I've only read the series through once. I would like to read them again. List below how many times you've read the, the series. <laughs> Because I've read like one and two, like two or three times each, but I just... Really? Yeah. Multiple? I, I've not yeah, read the book more than once. Read. Not not the in this series anyway. One. Now, The Deathly Hallows, about two, th like I'd say over half of it is them in the tent. If you remember reading this, guys, you get to over halfway through and you're like, they've killed so many people and they're still in a tent! How are they still in a tent? So... We kind of knew from David Yates, the director, that the first movie was going to be a road movie and a quite intimate movie, he described. Um, oh, 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 it might be our next book club what, series. Like, what, the whole series? The whole series. Oh, my days. I mean, it's all right when you get through the first three, and then it gets to the Goblet of Fire, and then you're like, well, yeah, I'm going to need a year to read that. Like, you know, You've read it four times, like the whole series? 
<laughs> wow. A dozen? <laughs> Literally a dozen. Like 12 times. <laughs> wow. Okay. Wow. Me neither. It still wraps it. Oh, Angie's oh. admitting that she, you don't want to let it go. Aww. But that's why we've got Fantastic Beasts. We've got like a five series thing and you still have Potter more and you've got all... You can go back and read it again. <laughs> now because of this speculation... Oh, oh, hello there. Good morning slash good evening. Oh yes, because it's going to be Sunday where you are. Wow, you must be... No, it's really... Yeah, it's really early. Where it's really well, yes. Anyway. Welcome to the stream. I'm talking about being in the art department and how, at the time, I was trying to guess where the split in the two films was going to happen because... It hadn't been revealed. It was a big secret. Everybody was talking about it. So I was trying to figure out from anything I could glean at the storyboards or talking to people where the split would occur. But I couldn't talk to anybody about it. <sighs> Anyways, now, other things that I saw um, from that room. Let's have a look. Uh, so I got to talk with the artists who had created all these things. You know, they were proud of their work. They, I don't know how long each of them had been there for. Sometimes artists come and go over the films, they might be there for two of the films, three of the films, some of them, all the films. But some of them had been there all the way back to the first film. Now the concept designer, uh, who was working on concepts for Giants. Now if you recall in The Deathly Hallows, we, we don't really see Giants much, but they had at one point wanted the Giants to be in armor. And there are concept designs, and you can actually see them in the finished film, but not in the way you think. Oh, we've got a comment from Duddles. Yes, I read them all four times. If I'd count the first three books, I read these three about six to ten times. Because when the books came out, I was in school slash university and had a lot of time reading on the train. I think we can relate to that. <laughs> For the first books, about two hours per, d per day. As in, like, you got through a book in two hours or you just you were reading for two hours during those books. And for the last books, four hours per day. What do you think about how fast such a book goes by then? Well, see, this is the thing. When the Deathly Hallows book came out, uh, that was a huge thing. Uh, my sister and mum went to go get both the Half Blood Prince and the Deathly Hallows at midnight. And I got a, a copy. But I did not wake up at midnight and read it. Uh, I waited until, like, you know, that afternoon or something. Um, and I tried to read it. Somebody said they read it in four hours uh, because everybody knew that they were all going to be talking about it and there were going to be spoilers and figure out how it all happened and, you know, all the way back at Godric's Hollow and all that kind of stuff. So I read for four hours on New Year's Eve and I got through maybe half of the book and I was just like, wow, my, like, I'm trying, but my brain is just, it's dead. Um, I, maybe it was the light, you know, it's kind of, it was dark, it was Christmas time. Crystal says, I'm betting they were just as big of potheads as if we're all not bigger. Could you just imagine letting your imagination go well to help create new things and then see them come to life? I think you've got it. I think they were really happy about working on the on the, on the the films and being part of not just a one single good film, but a phenomenon. A phenomenon, 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 phenomenon. Now, um, let's get back to some more juicy details, guys. Um, <coughs> do feel free to ask me, you can feel free to jump ahead, ask me about other things, I, you know, I will answer those questions. Uh, so these giants that I mentioned, they had wanted them to appear in the Hogwarts battle because they had decided to delete the battle slash fight at the end of the, the half of the Prince so as not to have basically the same climax at the end of the Deathly Hallows part two. If you remember in the half of the Prince book, Dumbledore gets killed and then there's a fight ensuing through Hogwarts, but in the film they just kind of show the Death Eaters sort of causing destruction and leaving. It was not a fight. So they decided to really ramp it up for the Deathly Hallows. Thus, the Giants were going to wear armour. And now in the finished film, you see the computer-generated giant that's just swinging around in the courtyard at one point. He's just got like a big uh, mace or chunk of wood or something. And that's really all you see of giants. So they had originally intended for them to play a slightly larger role in the battle. And so they had actually designed uh, and made some of these mock-ups. They had made one. Now, if you go into the DVD or Blu-ray or your iTunes copy, etc., and have a look when in the Deathly Hallows part two, uh, Harry and the rest of them go into the room of requirement, there are basically elements from all the films there. They literally kept everything they made on the Harry Potter sets. I had them lined up the runways, because th there was a runway there, and they just had them covered with huge big black tarpaulin, spray painted with white paint that said, um, you know, uh, boys dormitory left staircase or whatever. 
So they kept it all, and so they were able to reuse so many things. And so much of the interiors by this point um, were just housing warehouse space. Like up on a shelf, for example, Misha, if you switch to the desktop uh, again, one of the things that we saw, actually two of them we saw, uh, were the Ford Anglias. So Misha, there is a picture of the Ford Anglia right there where your mouse is. So they actually had more than one of these cars. Uh, one was for driving, one was for stunt work on the, the blue screen or the green screen. Oh, I've missed a couple of comments here. <coughs> uh, I'm, I'm betting they were just as big of... Oh, sorry, I read that one. Emerald Snail. Hello, Emerald Snail. Sad confession time, I never read the Harry Potter series. I really tried, but I didn't enjoy it. See, funny thing is, Emerald Snail, I did like the first one. I wasn't going to get into the books at all. Uh, my sister read Chamber of Secrets first because that was the gift, the book that she was given from her grandma. So she actually got really confused because Chamber of Secrets was the first book she read. And I didn't get into the books until later. It was only when we were on holiday in Dartmouth on the south coast of England that I saw this particular edition that I have, which I will, I will now carefully reach up and grab. Yep. Here it comes. So I have slightly different editions. We can't see you anyway. Okay. So we'll show it later. Thank you. Yes. Well, if you just put, put that there, we will show you my first edition book. But basically, I found this particular edi hardback edition of um, the Philosopher's Stone because that's the actual name because the author is British slash Scottish. Therefore, it's the Philosopher's Stone. Sorry, guys. It's not the Sorcerer's Stone. Did you know that they called it the Sorcerer's Stone because they didn't think that people in America would understand what a philosopher was in the right context or something? And that they recorded that scene, or the two scenes, where they mentioned the Sorcerer's Stone slash Philosopher's Stone twice. And therefore you have different versions. In fact, the texts of all the books are slightly different, not just about the Philosopher's Stone, but just some general edits. Look it up on Wikipedia if you haven't already, because I have, because I'm nerdy like that. <clears throat> Other comments, right. Uh, but yeah, as the series went on, uh, I could see that it was going towards a darker sort of war tone, but I did enjoy the books. I think that sometimes they might have dragged it uh, just in one or two little places, but uh, The Lord of the Rings is a much tougher read. Uh, the beginning of The First of the Ring, uh, I would have put down if I hadn't seen the books, uh, seen the films. Uh, Lita says, I started reading the series for the first time in the seventh grade. How old is the seventh grade? Uh, 14? 14. Okay, so you were 14 years old. Uh, there were four books out at the time. No, seventh grade. Seventh grade, yeah? Seventh grade? 13, 13, 14, something like that. 13 or 14. There were four books out at the time. See, I only really heard about um, Harry Potter when the first three were already out. I remember walking past W.H. Smith seeing that the fourth one was going to come out. I was like, how have I not heard of the first few books? You know, whatever. Um, I went to the midnight release of The Order of the Phoenix and read that book in two, two days. Wow, you must, have, you must have been really into it. Yeah, The Order of the Phoenix film was like the peak hype for the books because... That was, uh, you know, when it was uh, the last uh, book was coming out. <coughs> Crystal says, sweet, so is it now part of the tour? Uh, the giant in the armor? Yes, yeah, so if you go on to the actual set tour, you can see there's like a cage, and there's nothing there to denote what it is. There's just kind of like basically a cage of things, different assorted things. But there is this troll armor. It's basically like an old medieval chest plate, like front and back with holes for arms in the head and I think maybe some leg armor as well. But like, obviously this, this giant was sort of big and rotund compared to say the knights that they, uh, that McGonagall wizards up sort of thing. Oh, the car, a big part in the car. So was that part of the tour? Yeah, so walking around, it was basically like walking through like an Amazon or a Costco warehouse, if you can imagine it. But high racks, like I'm talking high, like a proper warehouse. They had two of these cars just up, like, who puts a car on a shelf? <laughs> I was just like, okay, there's Ford. It. Like, the, remember that this was 2009, so the Chamber of Secrets was released seven years before that, shot the year before that. And I'm like, okay, they just have two Ford Anglers that they've kept for seven or eight years on the shelf. You never see the Ford Angler again. They kept it on a shelf. Somebody put two of these cars up on a shelf. I'm talking at least 30 foot in the air, one or two, uh, at least two or three stories up in the air. Uh, there is a picture of us in the motorbike, but we'll, we'll come to that. If we do a book club, would you would would you do it? Would I do it, or would um, Emerald Snail do it, Allison. or Alison? Al Alice, why are you disappointed? What are you disappointed about? Uh, sorry, I'm just catching up with some comments here. Uh, Crystal, this American has been trying to get a hold of a Philosopher's Stone copy for years. Crystal, we could get you a copy <laughs> and send it to you, or. Yeah, I suppose I these days you could go to Amazon or eBay and, yeah. and get one if you wanted, or even a digital copy. If you switch your ebook store account 
location to Britain. I'm sure you can do it that way. But hey, who wants a digital book? Lita says, I have read Harry Potter so many times, I could no problem stop and wait to discuss. And then we've got 11, 12 years old, 13. You can't be three years old <laughs> difference. Surely the American education system isn't that messed up. Liz says, Ben, do you get free passes for life to the London Studio Tour because you should? I wish. I wish my name was on the film credits more than anything. My film, my film, my name is not on the film credits. I did not work there long enough. So I did not get free passes either, even though I did mention to one of the security guards after the tour that I'd, I'd worked on it. Uh, I've got to put these things somewhere. Things? What things? Did I miss something? Alice says, how did they even get it on the shelf? Oh, goodness. Well, I imagine they probably used one of those big forklift crane things. Uh, now, one of the cars would have had its engine hollowed out and just been a shell for, you know, making it easy to roll around and one of them wouldn't because it was actually drivable. Um, Crystal says, all of them, would they read those books if we did it in book club? Good question, people. Ask each other, would you participate? Uh, Alice says, disappointment was from the change from philosophers to sorcerers. Yeah, but I guess that's what film studios do. They try and make it good. If it's like Zootopia and Zootropolis. Yeah, I think like I stick, I call it Zootopia still because that's what the main marketing is. But Zootropolis is the name that they kind of released it under in Europe to, I guess, I appeal to that it's a metropolis rather than a utopia. But you know, there you go. So yeah, crazy things in this way. I mean, if you can imagine, I wish I had a picture. But if you go back to the Order of the Phoenix DVD guys and or the itunes version and look at the behind the scenes stuff oh liz thank you for joining very much uh hope you enjoyed the rest of the stream when you catch up on it later there will be more streams like this to come because there is so much to go through um enjoy the rest of your day hope you get lots of productive stuff done uh hugs to liz <coughs> but yeah essentially if you watch the order of the phoenix dvd extra bonus feature stuff there is a tour by nymphadora tonks who drives around and you can literally see what i was walking through it's kind of like a sped up little segment when they're transitioning from one part of the studio to the other. She takes you on a studio tour. That's where I was walking around. You can see things, you can freeze frame it, look at all the stuff they have from all the films. That was only film five at that point, but you get the idea. You can see all these things behind the cages because they were kind of like, there was a kind of a fence sort of thing, like, you know, like a Jurassic Park, a little fence in the way. So you couldn't go up and like pick things up, but you're just walking around and the producer's assistant, Angie's not like making reference to any of them much not much of them. You mean we aren't sitting here for the next six hours listening to Well, you could. I might have no voice tomorrow, which is a problem because I'm leading the meeting at church, but you know, I'm going to go through everything that I went on my first visit today. And then I'll go through, I was then back for another week later. Misha, if you want to um, change that picture, please, actually. Um, let's move on. Um, maybe take it back to OBS, actually. And we can have a look at the dragon. dragon. As in your dragon that you're colouring. How's everybody's colouring go? Have you have you finished your first printout if you've if you've got the one? Or if you've got multiples of the one? I finished mine. You've <laughs> finished it? Wow. You're faster than Alison because I remember Alison took more detail in the texturing and the gradients. Put it a bit closer. Do you want to name your dragon? She got like purple bracelets on her sort of forearms or something. Yeah, they're like uh, little things that you wrap around your whatever. I love that you were so super ambiguously Hi. descriptive. Will these be like in the videos to watch later if we can't watch the whole thing? Alice, absolutely. They will be available <coughs> for two weeks. What's available for two weeks? The videos are available <coughs> for two weeks. Until I become partner on Twitch when they're available for like ages. Currently they're available for two weeks. To rewatch. Uh, Misha, would you be so kind as to show the, the lovely stream peeps? This is the edition that I have of the Philosopher's Stone. As you can see, it is embossed with J.K. Rowling's signature. So she, she hasn't done that in golden pen. It's actually printed that way. Emerald Snail, I'm sorry that your laptop um, uh, failed on you. Ca Critical Catalyst, good job on finishing. Share a picture on our Discord. If you're not on our Discord, which I'm not sure you are, Feel free to join our Discord. Command Discord, join our Discord group, show us your picture. We'd love to see it. I do love seeing dragons and, and wizardy things. <coughs> Excuse me. Gosh, we've got loads to get through. Now, uh, let's see. 
they uh, not only had these artists been working on the Marauders map, for example, that we saw a little while ago, they had also been designing sort of more ephemeral things like Snape's Patronus, which you only briefly glimpse uh, in two parts of two films. One, I believe, is in the first part of the Deathly Hallows um, in the woods, when Harry's going to go and try and retrieve um, the sword from the bottom of the frozen lake. And then also later in the second film, when Snape's talking to Dumbledore and he casts his Patronus and he's like, always. <clears throat> I do I do a semi-good uh, Snape impression. Okay. Hello, my name is Alan Rickman. <laughs> I played Professor Snape in the Harry Potter movies. <clears throat> anyway, um, how are your impressions? Let me know. So they've been designing things like uh, Snape's Patronus. You know, that's just cool. Uh, now, Matt and I did notice a painting uh, of the, the basilisk and just other things like this that I mentioned. We were just gobbling it up with our eyes and sometimes we'd ask questions and sometimes we didn't because... Did we have a basilisk head? Did we have a basilisk head? Oh yeah, so if you want to bring up a picture of the non-dead catalyst, yeah. art channel. We've got a colouring channel. A colouring channel. Yeah. Oh yes, so as one of the channels in the Discord group is the colouring book channel. So yes, uh, do let us know. I'd love to see it. I'm sure everybody else would be interested to compare. Did I, did I not? Well, I think everybody remembers what the Bastos looks like, if not. But um, keep that up for a moment, dear. Let's, um, if you would like to bring up, what's that one on the right-hand side? Kingsley Shacklebolt. Right, 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 right. That one. This one? Yep. Oh, that's a bit small. Oh, okay, it is a bit small. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll leave that up for now. Okay, so, fun fact, uh, uh, this is jumping out of sequence, but again, ask me things out of sequence. I'm happy to talk about it. Mm -hmm. Oh, Lita says... Um, you can always delete and repost if you want. Yes, you may, you may delete and repost. <laughs> I know I could very easily get a copy of Philosopher's Stone from Amazon, but how cool would it be to get one from Ben and Misha? from us. Well, you can't have my copy. I mean, it's kind of my <laughs> copy. You know, I thought we going to get you any, any better copy anyway. Like, I could go get a copy from the shops here and be like, signed Ben Ben and Lucia can sign it. Be like, I could breathe on it or something and like, <laughs> put a spell on it. Um, Lita says, dang, I've been posting on the wrong channel. What channel? What the channel? Did you channel. Well, that kind of works. You know, the art channels. It is. That is art. You can put it in either. At least as mom says, your wallpaper on your desktop is very beautiful and busy. Very colorful and busy. I know, I love it. It's a, a library. She loves that library picture. It's it's like, I think, how she would want it. Misha loves libraries. She wants a library. She <laughs> wants to have a window bay like with library bookshelves on either side and then like an actual library sort of thing. Nevertheless, carrying on. Um... So, now we were never told, uh, this is Matt and I, my brother-in-law, who was with me, the responsible adult. Um, now we were told later that they had actually already shot that sequence from the Basilisk in the Chamber of Secrets uh, against green screen. And they will add the water and composite the footage in to the shots from the Chamber of Secrets. So we were like, ooh, ah, you know, so we were kind of nerding out. I mean, basically, imagine we were practically nerding out most of the time but sometimes you get that like, extra special moment when you would as a fan you wonder will they show this moment how will they show this moment and then you get a preview and you're like oh, <laughs> <clears throat> you know sort of white pants almost with excitement uh not that we did you know uh, i wouldn't admit to it anyway um just saying you know who would um now we were being told at this point that they were really pumping up the big battle. They, the director had kind of said in a little bit of press that that's what they were doing, but we were starting to see it. Now we saw lots of small white foam or wood and cardboard models of different sets. Now here, for example, that you are seeing right now is the set that they built. Yes, they built a London street, a T-junction actually to be precise, on the, on the set. Uh, now, Misha, if you close this image for a minute, um, we're going to show you on my 
picture of my map that I was sent uh, to Misha where this linden set was. So over the course of the films, they build these sets and they store them, uh, or parts of the sets, you know, depending on if it's like an interior set or not. Uh, generally, they went on location for London almost all the time. Well, yes. If you zoom into the top right-hand corner, you will see the words London set. Yeah, that's, that's about good. Now you can see kind of underneath it to the right what they have, the rigging yard slash container city. They had so many props, costumes, things that they had collected that they had literally what they called a container city. So these are truck containers stacked on top of each other, almost like a dock, like at the ports, just full of materials. Perhaps some of them were ready to be used, like I don't know, lots and lots of plaster of Paris or something, or carpets and fabrics, but this was also stuff that they had stored. And on this corner, they had decided to build uh, to build the London Street set that you've just been looking at. This set was built because paying the residents of a street and the council to close the street, film it for what would have been, you know, a night or two, actually worked out cheaper to build from the scratch. Now, this was only the facade. In the film, whenever you and this goes for TV as well, whenever you go from outside to inside, you're going from a studio set on the inside to an exterior set outside that's completely different and not attached. It's very rare that you have what they call an indoor-outdoor set, where you can go from the outside into the inside and it's where it should be, you know? Uh, for example, um, Four Privet, Privet Drive in the first film is a real location, but because the filming overspilled a day, they had to pay the residents more money to go back for the second day of filming, or the extra day. So from the second film onwards, you will notice that the opening shot of the Chamber of Secrets, Privet Drive, looks different. The, the layout of the street is different, the house is slightly different. And so this is why they, they built the London Set Street uh, here. And they reused it from the Order of the Phoenix to uh, a couple of shots in the half Blood Prince when Dumbledore, in his kind of uh, pensive flashback, goes to the orphanage where young Tom Riddle is. They used the same street. Now, the thing about that particular set was they had signs up everywhere saying not to walk up the steps to the front of the houses because it's not built in such a way to be a sturdy foundation. Only like the one set of stairs for with people to walk up. And because it had been there for probably a good year, maybe two years even, the sets start to weather and so they start to kind of basically crumble and decay because they're not built to last. Uh, except for the sets on the new studio, studio tour because they're there as a permanent feature. So that was cool. Um, that was a London set. Moving on then. Uh, da -da -da -da. So other parts that I got to see in the art department. If you imagine like tabletops uh, things. Now Misha, if you close that picture please. <coughs> Again, please ask questions. You'll be like, what's that you see on the map? Ask me about it. If Misha, if you could choose the top right hand picture please. Yes. So, for example, here is a picture, you can see here several pictures, uh, several models rather, of different sets. Now I'll explain this one. This one is the Lovegood residence. Now, as part of the tour in the day, Matt and I uh, went outside. They built this on, basically there's a huge amount of grassland, which there is less of now because they have built the studio tour next to the studio. Um, this is the most quiet the chat has ever been. I know, right? It's either a bad thing because I'm talking badly or because you're listening intently. Mm -hmm. Hopefully it's the latter. Oh gosh, there's 19 people listening to me waffling on. <laughs> Hopefully you're all having a good time. Also, is anybody still coloring in? Uh, is anybody coloring in a second one? Uh, Lita, did you have any of your... Completely entranced. We're all engrossed. Completely entranced. I have you under my spell. What spell would you have for that? Entrancigo? <laughs> Something like that, you know. Um, Accio nerds, something, you know, that's what we need to do. Um, so this, this picture, uh, this, this set, this is basically what the art department is full of. Who's coloring? Little Gem's still coloring. Yay! Uh, still coloring, still coloring. Crystal's like, um, <laughs> um, <laughs> Crystal's full of great one-liners, I love her. So you can see here there's a red line going around basically the bottom third of the house and also around certain parts of the ground 
Diddle says, I'm enjoying it a lot and right now eating extremely late dinner. Extremely late? 9.30. What, 9.30. <laughs> what are you having? Is it butter beer? Uh, Alison's clearing it. Well, Alison, you do a really nice, good job with gradient textures, so I'd be interested to see what your finished dragon looks like. So this, uh, the house, this, the red line is basically saying this is what they will build physically on set. And anything that is outside, so the, so the top two thirds <coughs> of the Lovegood residence was not built on the set. And everything else outside of the grass red line was also going to be surrounded <gasps> by a giant green screen. You're the Luna lover. Luna, what do you mean? How do you not recognize the Lovegood residence? I know that they don't have the floating, um, like pumpkin-y things. Uh, chocolate frogs. You're eating chocolate frogs? It's got all the important food groups. That's true. Um, don't eat the cardboard card that comes with it. Potatoes and quark? What is quark? Alpaca, you have wet nails. I take it you've painted your nails. You can make chocolate frogs? Do they jump out of the train? No. So we're walking around this Lovegood residence and they had just finished filming not so long ago on this and so they just left it up. They put up a massive green screen around half of it. So basically the green screen would go around the back of it as you're looking at this image. And so the front half behind the camera image was open to the rest of the studio complex. <clears throat> and so they extended the house digitally and then the surroundings, because you remember, basically the Lovegoods live in the middle of nowhere. That was all inserted uh, digitally afterwards. But the, here's a fun fact, the design, like the painting, if you remember when they get up to the doorstep, you can see like Luna has painted the house and there's all these floating fruits and things. That was actually the actress's input to like, that is her artwork. She may not have done the painting, but she did the artwork and then the art department construction crew put it on. So that was fun. So we're walking around all these large external sets that they had and you know they only used a little bit of um quark oh, that's interesting let's have a quick look at that does anybody else know what quark is because i have never heard of quark you've had it before have i yeah. i've had i've known quark as like the star trek character but other uh, other exter i'm waiting for wikipedia to finish loading sorry so <clears throat> so crystal says wait wait the house wasn't a real set it was all digital no, no, the house was real. So everything in that red border, if you kind of zoom in, depending on what screen you're looking at, and you can see a red line. Misha, if you just oblige them with a zoom in there. There's the red line here and here. And so this was all built. Yeah, so everything within the red line was built. So it was actually on a grass sort of field anyway. So the grass was there. So they just had to insert some of the rocks, the big slabs, the steps, and then the lower third of the house they did build. The rest of it was extended digitally in post-production and then the fields further away, the landscape was put in afterwards. Quark is a type of fresh dairy product made by warming steroid milk. It kind of looks like mashed potatoes and cream got together. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's get back to the chat. Uh, no, it was not all digital. Well, maybe in some wide shots it was, but... But there you go. Now, some of the other things that we got to see them, let, let's talk about that. And again, ask me, did I see this? Did I see that? Please, please feel free to ask and jump around. Uh, <clears throat> uh, yeah, so we saw all these models, these types of models we saw lots of. So I, we saw, you know, where the dragon lives underneath Gringotts. We saw a set mock-up just like this, and we could see how many stories they built what part of the set they're going to build, and also just how big the set was going to be in terms of its height, because the dragon has to fly all the way up to the bottom of the bank. It was surrounded by dirigible plums. There you go. That's what it was. Well done, Lunalita. That's what we'll call you. I did not recognize it bare. What do you mean? Because it didn't have any dirigible plums. <laughs> well, there you go. I guess everyone's, you know, human. Um, I don't know what a cork is. So now some of the other cool things that we got to see uh, was the Hogwarts, like for these models, I mean, was the Hogwarts interior corridor. So there is basically a T-junction that they built from film five onwards of corridors that they could build and so that they could walk through an act. And in uh, Half-Blood Prince, they extended the T-junction and it's where often the characters kind of bump into each other for literally just like one scene where they're walking through and just giving each other a bit of exposition. Reminds me of Chalissa, Dragon Spell. I'm afraid I have not read the book but yes i does oh. anybody else remember reading Celise. C C C Celise? Like does anybody else remember reading the philosopher's stone and harry i think describes how 
he could have sworn he heard like a dragon or thinking he heard or saw it. I think he only heard a dragon. And then I remember thinking, wow, is there a dragon? And then six books later, you come back and you actually have this whole sequence with that dragon. I remember seeing the dragon, I think in the trail, I was like, oh, that's a really pale dragon. I was like, oh. I was kind of, usually dragons, you kind of imagine in films as fearsome things, but it was correct to the book because, you know, that dragon hadn't seen daylight for probably donkey's years. Um, so yeah, we got to see that set mock-up. Uh, also other sets that we got to see uh, was the Gringotts carriage. So Misha, if you close this picture, so the Gringotts carriage, so that's how they get in, you know, like the sort of like the roller coaster ride. Uh, the green screen picture. So, um, essentially, th this is not the Gringotts carriage, uh, although I did see that when we had the studio tour several years later. They had the, um, the mock-up of it because they decided how is it going to work. BRB getting snacks. Alpaca has to shout these things because snacks are very important. They, they, were, they filmed the, the carriage, the Gringotts carriage, against a big green screen, such as the one you are seeing right now, although those are not carriages. Now, other things we got to see was a mock-up of the Dark Forest. Um, so the Dark Forest in this film was an entire set recreation. I believe in the first film, or at least the first film, they did shoot some of it in a real forest and some of it was shot in a set. Now, probably there were some more sets, I just can't remember them. <clears throat> now, all the damage that happens to Hogwarts in this film was quite severe, but it kind of happens in phases. Um, but as the battle progresses, because it's so, <coughs> excuse me, so long of a battle. Um, if you, if you really pay attention to film continuity, like in Avengers Age of Ultron, there are statues that get more and more broken and decayed and lose arms and things as the Battle of so Sokovia goes on. The same thing here, um, with, uh, the Battle of Hogwarts. So we would see that the exterior courtyard, which, fun fact, changes size. Uh, not in this film, but from the previous film. So the courtyard you remember really first seeing in the Prison of Azkaban had a water fountain feature in it, and you would see Crookshanks running around and Hermione shouting at Ron saying, you know, leave my cat alone. Ron's like, you hate scatters. I hate you, but I love you. Sort of thing. Uh, now, it's fair to say there's probably more than one courtyard because in the games there is. Uh, but in The Death of the Hallows, they decided to make the courtyard a lot bigger than it was from the previous film so that they could have all the action and make it big. Yes, I, Crystal, I will have another drink. <laughs> Sorry. So we got to see that. And we got to see that they actually made four stages of damage. But yet they did not do it sequentially. They had a really damaged section, which they shot first, and then took away some of the boulders and destroyed bricks and tiles and things, shot some of that, and then destroyed some more of it again. And they had this basically architectural map that they had of the floor. So all the levels of ramps of boulders and stuff, they had mapped out to the tiniest detail. It was, I mean, just thinking, what are you doing today? I am destroying Hogwarts. That must have been kind of sad, actually. I mean, especially if you're kind of fond of the series. I wish he'd played a bigger role in the third movie. Who scabbers? Oh, Cro oh, Crookshanks. Yeah, Cro Crookshanks has a, little, a few more sort of hints to sort of clue us up as readers, doesn't he? Kind of like um, when Hermione spots um, who, uh, who's the um, the uh, what's her name? The journalist lady. Who's the journalist lady? The annoying one, uh, Rita Skeeter. She sees a little bug or something on a flower, like popping up in these different places but that's kind of completely left out of the book, of the films. <clears throat> now, at one point, I remember that Angie, the production assistant who was taking us around, took a phone call on her iPhone. Again, I was like, ooh, iPhone. Uh, from the production manager. And now I knew about this production manager because I'd got all the DVDs. I'd watched all the special features, as I do. And this production designer for all of them, including the Fantastic Beasts series, is Stuart Craig. He is very good at what he is. He is primarily responsible for the look of Hogwarts. <coughs> I believe in the books, J.K. Rowling doesn't really describe how, like, the materials or the fabrics of what Hogwarts look like. But when they were deciding on the first film, they thought, well, the only architecture really around a thousand years ago when Hogwarts was made were cathedrals and castles. Hence, Craig took the, Stuart Craig took the decision to make 
Hogwarts castle, you know, specifically go for that type of medieval look, both inside and out. Did you see anything about the hippogriff? Oh yes, absolutely. Let's jump. Misha, could you close that particular image? Yeah. Now we went to the, which for me was a really cool department, which was the creature and makeup department. Um, there is a picture from the studio tour. This one? Yes. Now they actually made three hippogriffs for the Prisoner of Azkaban. And they, again, they kept all these things. The hippogriff was a really expensive thing to make. Now, this particular hippogriff is sitting there. The one I saw when I walked in, literally you go through the entrance and there is a standing book beak that they made. And essentially out of his butt are coming these huge chunks of cables. And I don't just mean like a few wires. I mean like basically almost piping, um, which was a little weird, but you could just see like base, as you see in this picture, he looks amazing and you're like, Oh, that's a hippogriff. You almost feel like you have to bow, bow, and he has to bow back to you, but he was not working that day. I guess he was petrified or something. So yeah, there was a standing book beak that we go in and we see, and we were just, I, like, I think I actually kind of, when nobody was looking, I kind of just stroked his feathers. <laughs> <laughs> yes, animatronic. So an animatronic is basically an animated electronic essentially a puppet that is controlled electronically. So Muppets are controlled by hand. Sorry to break the illusion fourth wall of other franchises. But uh, a lot of animatronics can simply be face animatronics. Now, for example, uh, in the Goblet of Fire, when you first see Voldemort, he's like a shriveled baby, and you see him again in Deathly Hallows Part 2. They built an animatronic because... Uh, I do, I didn't select it as one of these pictures. We can share it again later. Was feathers soft? They were like, I, I, I'm not sure they were really all real feathers. Um, you know, because they had used him and he needed a little bit of repair, you know, like uh, plushes, for example, they kind of lose some of their softness and bristles or some of their fur falls out. But we had lost just, just a little bit of his finesse. Um, yeah, he's, again, he's not a real animal, but... <laughs> Um, yeah, he was soft, but you know, underneath there's a lot of, st because um, the actors have to sit on him, he has to be hard and sturdy, whereas a real animal would have, you know, some give to the muscle and the soft skin tissue texture. But yes, he, the, the feathers were, I think, a, a combination of real and fabricated feathers as well. So the fabricated ones weren't, of course, as uh, soft because they had to withstand the rigours of being on location in Scotland. And I think they were trying to use him. No, he's real. Look, he's there. Look, I have a picture of him. <coughs> it's just, um, he wasn't moving, that's all. So, um, going into the creature department was absolutely amazing because that's the first thing you've seen, just like, Aww. Hands are crisp, but oh, thank you very much. Crisps would be nice. Nachos would be nice, actually. Now, moving on in departments, um, after Angie had taken her phone call from production designer Stuart Craig, uh, we went down to the warehouse floor and we were seeing, um, because the warehouse is so big and these, there's more than one place that they are filming or building sets at the same time. So for example, oh, my mum's trying to FaceTime. I'm just going to have to reply into this and be like, sorry, I can't pick up right now. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, excuse me, we'll have a quick sip. Sorry, mum, you can't join the stream in this particular fashion. Um, she could always ask me through stream, like, did shot, 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 shot of water. Oh, I don't think you want to watch me having shots of water. But essentially, um, and again, you can see this in the Order of the Phoenix DVD, because they might have st uh, stage G and stage H, and in fact, uh, Green Gots and Diagon Alley were in a completely different location at the other end of the compound, like a separate building that would have housed, I guess, I don't know, airplane parts or a hangar or something. They built all of Gringotts and uh, Diagon Alley in a different building, which I did not get to see, actually, which was really disappointing uh, because they had just finished the week before and they'd torn it down to build something else in there, I guess. But we did get to see all these bikes that people would use to get between these locations because you don't want to waste time spending 10 minutes, especially for your directors and actors and people. Uh, they did have golf carts, but like the director would have a bike with his name on it, for example, and they'd have parking bays for these bikes, like almost like a college university, you'd have a row of, uh, row of bikes and all that kind of stuff. Now, other things that we saw 
walking down through the warehouse space was <clears throat> the Mirror of Erisad. Oh my days, I saw the Mirror of Erisad. I can't remember if it was um, facing me though or not. Did I look into the Mirror of Erisad? What did I say? What would you guys see if you looked into the Mirror of Erisad? And does everybody know that Erisad is simply the word desire spelt backwards? <sighs> Mind blown. Erisad. Yeah, in English. No, I don't, because I didn't take a picture because I would have probably been expelled <laughs> from Hogwarts. Oh, sorry, I've seen it actually. So there were three flying Ford Anglias, not two. Three. Three! And now here's something else. Now, from the Half-Blood Prince, you remember that there was a, <clears throat> like a boat that they used to sort of float across. Why didn't they just apparate? Come to think of it. Plot hole. Or was it a plot hole? Could you apparate from one side of the cave onto the island in the middle? Why not just apparate? Because clearly they apparated to get outside. Uh, am I overthinking this now? Surely somebody will put me right. <sighs> anyway, so yes. Uh, so the boat from the cave was just kind of up on the like a first story view. Like they were kind of like on shelves. Like so the boat was just there. The Christmas decorations from the Hogwarts corridors. And so they had a lot of them. And this is around Christmas time. So I was like, oh look, there's Christmas decorations. Uh, Duddle says, I did know it, and yes, I know what I'd see. Would you see socks? I thought that was such a sad <laughs> part of the Philosopher's Stone when Harry asks Dumbledore, what did you see? And he's like, he, you can tell that he kind of looks away and thinks about it, and he's like, a pair of socks. Or was it mismatched for socks or something? You know, something whimsical, wasn't it? But you could tell that he was lying and probably thinking about Grindelwald or something, as we, so I think, now later know. Uh, other things that I saw were Hogwarts statues. So you know as you see the different films, you see the different founding fathers or figures of uh, Hogwarts. So those statues were still there. They were still uh, lying around. You can see one or two of them on the studio tour still. Now there were those... Um, if you've seen a, you know, any bunch of TV or film, you know that when you get to the place they are actually filming, the live set they have doors double doors in this case with red lights on the outside to show that they are filming and you cannot enter you have to wait you can't go in or out because any sound will be picked up because it's a huge big space and what they had done to kind of counteract the fact that it wasn't purpose designed as a studio they put basically kind of padding on the walls but not necessarily on the ceilings um, to kind of absorb some of the sound. You know, like you go into a room with no carpet, it's got more of an echo, but when you put carpet down, it doesn't echo as much. But think of that, for, but for walls. Uh, Misha, if you could close this picture, we'll show you what that looks like, actually. <clears throat> it's the picture of me, Matt, Angie, and Dan Ratcliffe, which is mm, sort of in the middle, image 0007. Here it is. Here is me, Matt, my brother-in-law, the ginger one on the left, and Angie, the producer's assistant, who looks very official with her iPhone and binder and stuff. And then, yes, Daniel Ratcliffe on the right, on the set, the partial set, should I say, of Gringotts exterior behind Matt, those columns with um, the Daily Prophet poster things up of undesirable number one, behind Harry as well, uh, leading down that side street. What is that side street called? I feel like I know what it is and I can't remember. It's not Nocturne Alley. Nocturne Alley is uh, further up. That is a different street. It's where in the Deathly Hallows Dobby and what's the other elf? The, you know, the creature. creature. Dobby and Creature um, ambush that cockney guy. But yeah. And he's on a, and he's on a stoop. Yes? He is standing on the ledge. We can show you that. that. There is another picture. Um, but you, if you see the gap between the set, what looks like basically like some brown stripey stuff, that is the padding they've put on the set wall to absorb the sound. So if the camera looks that way, they have to replace it or put a green screen there to fill it in. In this particular movie, though, they don't show that particular angle. So this is the thing. It's not a full set. Now, a full set is where you can turn around 360 degrees. <laughs> it's a alpacas. Uh, fan going. Um, oh, Alice, enjoy your lunch if you, you haven't already. Uh, lunch is very important. So, a, th a 360 degree set is a complete set. This is a partial set because you can look at certain parts of it and you can see basically the camera crews and the walls behind it. So, um, Daniel Ratcliffe, fun fact, I believe is about five foot four, five foot five. 
Misha for fun reference is five foot three. So basically I am six foot one, six foot, and Daniel Ratcliffe is indeed for that part of the film supposed to be standing there. Misha, if you'd be kind enough to switch the image to the picture of just Daniel and I. Uh, in portrait. Thank you. Made it. Hello, Regina Postma. Welcome. We are at a very exciting part. Everyone's waited very kindly for me to get to this part. This is me actually on the set with Daniel Ratcliffe. This is just the end part of the Diagon Alley set. So there is not Ollivanders, there is only one shop uh, opposite. This is the scene where um, Ron Hermione, but Hermione as um, Bellatrix, and Warwick Davis as Griphook, and Dan as Harry Potter, are trying to get in two Gringotts. And they're all like, oh, this is a bad idea. And then Bellatrix is all, good morning. And then Griphook's like, good morning. What do you want about Bellatrix doesn't say good morning? Yes, so as you can see, I mean, I'm, I'm, I guess you'd say tall. I mean, I'm six foot one, six foot. And this is an official set photo. Despite the fact there were like no photos, except for these certain ones, they actually had the real set photographer come up and take pictures. Now his camera was in like a very odd boxy case that meant that he could take pictures and it would soundproof it so you could not hear the mirror moving on the camera. Because normally there's like a sound every time you take a picture. Some cameras make a digital sound because it doesn't have a mirrored lens. That's some photography nerdness for you. And so you could never hear him taking pictures, but you could see him pressing the button. So he actually took this and he put this into an official frame. And you can see at the bottom actually that there's a copyright notice. Um, so we, we were given get this, five copies of these official set photos and told we couldn't share them. Um, so you're like, here's your cake, but you can't eat it. And you're just like, um, I guess it's kind of like Harry knowing that Sirius was alive and had escaped, but he can't be with him sort of thing. You know, sad. Good, but sad. So yes, Harry, when I stand up and Misha stands up, my head tops Misha's head. So Daniel Ratcliffe is... What one? Sure. So me, Matt, and me, Matt, and Dan. Now people often ask, "What's he like? What's you know? What's he like?" He's nice. He's fine. Now he grew up from like the age of nine or ten, being Harry Potter. So he has been the centre of attention for essentially all of his teenage and early adult life. Like he's less in the spotlight now, but he sort of had. If you've ever seen any interview footage of him on the DVDs or on news shows, uh, whatever, chat shows, he was basically like that, but in real person. So he would be standing around waiting for the next shot setup or the next take, and we were asked to go step onto the set here with him. And that was super cool, because it's like, I'm on a Harry Potter set. Like, I'm not just looking into the set. I am now on a set. And I wished it was the whole of the Gringotts and the whole of the Diagon Alley set, but it was just this part. But still, that was amazing. Lita has a question. Lita has a question. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, do you have any pics with Emma or Rupert? Fun fact, Rupert was um, sat behind us. So the, the, pre, uh, the preamble to this little part of the scene was we were sat with the, I was sat next to David Yates, the director, for a good 20 minutes whilst they did a few takes on this. Not on this part, in the kind of like the little alleyway, not the one behind us right now, but the other alleyway where you see them kind of lingering before they put the cloak over Ron. Was it Ron? No, they put the cloak over Grip Hook, sorry. Um, and believe you me, guys, oh my days, Helena, Helena Bonham Carter fooled me. I thought that it was genuinely Emma Watson in makeup slash prosthetics as Helena Bonham Carter because not only were her mannerisms correct, but her idiosyncrasies and the way that she was speaking made me think it was Emma Watson. And it took me 20 to 30 minutes for me to notice it was Helena and not Emma Watson. And I'm like, wow, she is good. And now in the finished film, they do dub over Emma Watson's voice, but Helena was doing a very good impression. Um, and you, you don't get to see that in film because you, you don't hear Helena's vocal performance with her physical performance. 
Uh, Emma was at college. Yes, you're absolutely right, Apaka. Emma Watson at that time was at Brown, I think it was, or Harvard, uh, one of the two of those. Brown. Brown. So she was, this is the thing, she was completing her university studies whilst this was going on. So some of the time they had to have a double stand in. Now, some of the times it's stunt work, like the cafe scene in the beginning of the Deathly Hallows, where the Death Eaters turn up and they're all fighting over their lattes and cappuccinos. That, some of that is stunt work when you see them from the back. Uh, other times they had to have Emma come in and they'd either green screen her in or they'd just shoot close-ups of her on her own or, you know, against a wall or whatever. And sometimes they're all together, uh, but not all the time because she was at university. So that's not only are you doing university, but you're coming, you're flying across the Atlantic, presumably several times, to come do your film book and then fly back again. And then people are like, oh yeah, you went to go film some more Harry Potter stuff. What did you do? And you're like, I can't tell you. So anyway, so this was a, this studio space is a large insulated, so it's kind of a little dark around the corners because all the lights are concentrated on the set. Uh, Dan, let's maybe you can get me a sip of water, could you please? Because people are going to start worrying that I'm going to lose my voice. <laughs> well, it's, you've almost been going for two hours, so I guess you just drive on the place you're going to stop. Yes, yes. Now, they had um, lots of fire retardant cloth on the walls, which also at, doubled as that sound um, sort of absorbent. Now, this one big space actually contains several interior sets. The main, though, was this one that you're looking at, the Diagon Alley one. Now, also in the space, they had Dumbledore's office, which was not being used, because you, I, I don't have a picture of... Oh, I do, actually. Do I? I, I know I have one, I just don't remember if I got it out. Yes, I do, bottom right-hand corner. Here you go. Here is me sitting in Dumbledore's chair in his dusty office because, if you remember, you don't see Dumbledore's office, well, not in part one at least, anyway, and you only see it briefly in part two. So they'd kept these set. this film, this set had been there since the Chamber of Secrets. It hadn't moved. They'd had to build it out of pretty sturdy uh, materials. Uh, also, fun fact, you know how in The Order of the Phoenix at the end there's a scene behind Dumbledore's chair and you can see above it there's another floor which they got extra investment to build but they never ever shoot a scene up there and the film franchise's most expensive prop is up there and you never see it. Now if you go online you can have a look. It's basically they figured at the time of the Chamber of Secrets Hello, Vicky. Welcome. Hello. I can't pronounce that. Zil, I, I know I've chatted to you. Zil, Zil, I've heard Stacey say it and I can't remember how she said it. I do apologise. You'll have to tell me how to do it. Yes, type command colour in either American or English. There you go. Thank you, Alison. And you can download for free a digital copy and print it out or use your digital app to colour it in along with us. Um, so, the... Yes, the set. So basically, they reckon that Dumbledore was a stargazer, you know, he was a bit of an astronomer, and you see that in some of the times that you visit his office, like in the Prison of Azkaban. And they have, they've custom built this huge metallic kind of sphere chair, like out of Men in Black, but they had it so that it could kind of pivot along the floor, like on a rail or a track, and they had spent a lot of, like, I'm talking like £100,000 or something, or £10,000, I forget which, in great Ziliel, Ziliel, Ziliel. Am I getting that right? Ziliel. Zil Zil I do apologise. Ziliel. Hello. Welcome. And so they put this huge amount of time and money into this prop that you only ever briefly glimpse in the background. And I thought it wouldn't have been that hard to have started a scene with Dumbledore hanging around it, but you know they never did. I guess that's because the director of the second, first and second one. Uh, who was, fun fact, originally supposed to do all the films, um, didn't. He, he didn't do it. He, he um, found out that the first film was hard. The second film had a shorter time scale to do, so he just was burnt out. So that's why they brought in different directors from film three onwards. And it gave it a, he, he also realised that they needed a, a, fresh and, a fresh pair of eyes. So anyway, Dumbledore's set was great. Now this is where my wand comes in, skipping ahead in the day somewhat. Um, Alice, hug, yes, Ben, you got it. Yay! Misha, can you bring up OBS, please, and switch to the live webcam? Uh, yeah. So, in this writing desk, um, I was sat on this chair. By the way, Dumbledore's chair is so uncomfortable to sit in. Bearing in mind that actors would have had to sat, like, both uh, Michael Gambon and Richard Harris would have been sat there for hours sometimes. That chair was not comfortable. 
most chairs only go up most of the way up your back or up to your shoulders so that you're kind of free. And also it's kind of cushioned on ordinary chairs. His chair only had cushions on his bum, like a couple of cushions, and it wasn't that comfortable. And the back was uh, kind of like carved, like wooden. <laughs> Uh, do you like my uh, do you like my hypo scarf and uh, my prisoner of Azkaban shirt? Misha is now holding my wand. Now in that writing desk, I was sat there. I sat down. I was, they took a picture of me, and I thought this chair's really uncomfortable. But I'm in double dust writing desk. <clears throat> now I just was nosing around his desk, and I wondered if the writing desk part actually lifted up because old writing desks actually open up, don't they? You have your writing materials and paper and books inside, and it did. And at that point, Angie, the assistant. Um, said, Harry put that there for you, kind of almost winking at me. Um, maybe they gave him cushions. Well, maybe, but um, there he wasn't comfortable to sit in. So yeah, this wand is the wand from Dumbledore's writing desk. I, I like to kind of think that he um, had to confiscate it from a student <laughs> and keep, you know, like an unruly student who, did, you know, it's like detention, you know, you have to lose your wand for a, a weekend or something. What? You have a wand? Yes. Now, somebody came to my house, what's <clears throat> an American, and picked it up and he says, is this real? Does it work? <laughs> and I'm like, yes, it's real. No, it doesn't work. Yeah, it's not that kind of real. It's, it's not the Elder Wand. Exactly. It's, oh, that, yes, it's not the Elder Wand. It's just, I don't think this one's on sale. Well, I don't know. This is the thing. They never really told me if this was a prop one. I doubt they'd give me a prop wand. I mean, they made literally hundreds of prop ones for the... Well, it could be, because it kind of has that look of being... Like, it's good quality. Like, I believe it sounds like wood. Can, can you hear that? Like, so this is made out of wood. It's not, like, made out of plastic or anything. And looking at it close up, you can see the grain and where they've kind of varnished it and stuff. But it could be a mass-produced one. But, you know, they literally did make hundreds of ones for the extras and they had to return them. So that's why I don't think they would have given me a prop wand. But maybe this is a prop wand. They literally never told me. That's why I think it's one that Dumbledore took off of a student. <clears throat> <laughs> so what did I do there? So, ah, it's my book's falling over. So at uh, this time, this is simply me visiting the set because I had chemotherapy for my cancer, which I'm completely free of. No worries, I'm absolutely fine. Um, I asked through a foundation called the Willow Foundation to have a special day out to visit the studios because I was a film student and basically I couldn't go to university during my second year very much because I was having treatment. And we really wanted to go as a group uh, of students to a studio, which never happened. And so therefore I asked, could I go to Leaveston Studios? Leaveston Studios and the charity were like, N -n -n. but then they said, yes, actually you could go. So that's how I got to go and be on the set. Uh, now, there's plenty more stuff that I did when I went back for a second time after my visit because what happened was at the end of the day, um, because they, I had been speaking with Angie, the assistant, uh, the producer's assistant uh, in email correspondence, they knew that I was a film student and they knew uh, that I had an interest, like I'd, I knew what a previs was. Previs, for those who don't know, is short for pre-visualization. That's what you do that's kind of like a... a game level type building blocks, better than Minecraft, but you know, not like full PS4 graphics or anything. So that you can visualize a sequence that's usually an action sequence or something with like, I don't know, a dragon or something. So you can see how it works better than just a storyboard. I knew what that was, so I'd ask questions. And so they showed us parts of the production that I was interested in that other people wouldn't have been interested in, like, you know, looking at scripts, uh, uh, not scripts, sorry. Um, sheets like call sheets now uh, for those who didn't see it earlier this is the map that i was given of the filming complex now it has grown subsequently with the production of fantastic beasts and where to find them being filmed on the same location they built extra warehouse space took some of the grassland put car parks for the public you can now color yay alpaca <laughs> coloring is fun maybe i'll get to do that one day Becca has colouring books as well, and Misha's got some of those, and she likes colouring those in. Now, um, so yeah, what I actually did on the film to answer the question, which I will answer more in a subsequent stream, is I got to actually help film on the sets and also helped work in the edit bays. So I was there in work experience, but this time I'm simply here as a guest with my responsible adult, my brother-in-law. 
Yes, Misha. So it's nine o'clock. Yes, dear. Um, did you, how much longer did you want I, to... I want to get to the bottom of the page at least, and that's kind of halfway through. No, that's more like a third of the... Actually, that's more like a quarter of the way through. There's so much to go through. That's fine. Okay, that's so fine. finish that, and then we, you know, we can always do more than getting... I'm sure if people... Hello, welcome back. <clears throat> Thank you, Alison. Thank you for joining us. Okay, so uh, my just making sure that I can see what you're seeing. Okay, so Misha is going to show you a picture. Uh, sorry for that brief interruption. Uh, if you open the uh, sidecar image 0133, second from the top left. Now, one of the things you saw in the film was this. I mean, sort of this. Now, one of the things that we saw was a huge, complete green screen set. Like, the walls, completely green screen. Like, they'd painted it or put curtains up. <clears throat> oh, hello. Thank you, Duddles, for subscribing with a tier one subscription. Two months, Two months in a row oh. now means that your subby gets horns. horns. <clears throat> Thank you so much for your support. Misha really appreciates it. I mean, I guess by proxy you're supporting me. <laughs> Can you not use a time turner to correct this? You know, that's a great idea, Regina Postma. I don't have one, but I have a friend who does. They live in London. That's about four hours away. So I may take eight hours to get one, but then you'd never notice the time difference. So just to show you a few pictures. This picture then, they had, uh, whilst we were there, a stunt sequence being filmed. The beginning of the Deathly Hallows part one, you notice there's the seven Harry sequence. This took them a long time to film. In fact, one shot took 97 takes to do, and that's the part where you see all seven Harrys getting dressed at the same time on a motion control rig, uh, and Daniel Ratcliffe performs all of it, and he has to do it to match everybody else's performances. He had to match what they were doing and get it right. However, this was what they were filming on the green screen stage at the time, is they had Hagrid, um, like a stunt performer guy, who I've actually met in real life, uh, away from the sets, in my work, can you believe it? who was a former rugby player, and I can't remember his name, I'm afraid. I think it was Steven something. Um, he is huge. He is like six foot six or six foot seven. Uh, he is basically who you see on film during the Prison of Azkaban when he's walking around in the Care of Magical Creatures class outside when he's not talking. That is the rugby guy wearing an animatronic face head rig with really hot, heavy cables and stuff going into his backpack. Uh, under his hair and shoulders and all that um, to sort of broaden him up and um, so he would have been in the stunt sequence they were filming the part where they go through the tunnel which was supposed to be the Dartford tunnel in London which was actually shot in the Liverpool tunnel fun fact and then they had to reduce the four lanes down to two this uh, sidecar with classic size tires that's my Mitch the knowledge coming out there modern Michael motorcycle tires aren't shaped like that uh, and they had a stunt Harry in where Misha is. Now, Misha, how did it feel being in that little sidecar? Um, it wasn't the most comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> wasn't the most comfortable. Now, can you imagine spending the whole day filming? Now, the thing was, is they were on a scissor lift, at least 12 foot in the air, uh, with some mats underneath. Um, but they would turn them, they were on a rig that basically turned the whole sidecar and motorbike upside down for the sequence where, in the tunnel, Hagrid rolls up the wall and onto the roof and Harry kind of half falls out and his feet run across the rooftop of a bus. And they were filming that shot on the stage. And so that was, uh, that was really cool to see. The, uh, the amazing physical fitness that the stunt Harry had to be able to hang and do like the whole pretending his feet were running on the rooftop of a bus that wasn't there. And then he would pull himself back up into the car after the camera had finished rolling and sit upside down. He wasn't on a harness. He was not wearing a seatbelt. He was not on a bungee cord to pull him back up. Just with his arm power alone, he kind of just hooked himself back up into the seat and I guess wedged his feet under the chair or something. Incredible. I mean, I'd pass out from all that like blood to rushing she had. Anyway, next picture. Misha, if you could move us on. Uh, other things that we saw, if you can have a look at um, image 0092, the Ministry of Magic sculpture. It's 
the fourth one along. So going into the art department creature room uh, where there was the hippogriff, we saw a, a sculpture. This was right next to Aragog and, well, the two Aragogs actually, because there was two versions made, the living one and the dead one. Um, they were sculpting this. This <clears throat> took literally months for one guy to sculpt. And you see it in a handful of shots. You see it close up in a couple of shots. But they had built a smaller scale one as a proof of concept. And then this guy was working on this full size one. So for those who haven't really noticed it perhaps during the films, it's the muggles oppressed under the might of the ministry, the ministry logo. And so this person not only just sculpted the basic column, but each person is fully sculpted, their clothes, their facial features, everything. And they're all basically in distress and pain. And that was kind of like almost like a Nazi Stalin kind of feeling. Like you see it close up, like, like I was literally almost, is it gone totally? What's gone totally? I don't know what. Please clarify your comments, little gem. Super offensive to Hermione. What's, what? The statue. Oh, oh yes, I guess it would be. That was, um, that was something we got to see. That was cool. Took him months to do for one set. One Next. Another, yeah, we'll have another picture. Okay, so if you go to the next image long. Yeah, it's still going. Refresh, little Joan, refresh. If you go to image 0080, the green screen cape. Now, this is the thing. Did you know that there's a couple of different approaches to doing the cloak of, uh, not cloak of lamentation, that's Doctor Strange. Uh, cloak of invisibility, the invisibility cloak. So because it's supposed to hide people and the best way in computer graphics to remove something is to have a color that you can easily isolate and remove, hence green screen, also blue screen and occasionally red screen. But green screen gives what they call a good key. It's good isolated, people don't have green eyes or skin uh, of that shade and so it's easily removable. And so the inside of this particular cloak is covered in the green screen material so that when somebody wears it, um, you can easily remove them in the computer later. Although when we were seeing the, f the scene being filmed in Diagon Alley, they didn't even have a cloak. Ron, who was there, and he was, I didn't get to really interact with on that particular day, but I did later. Um, he was simply miming, throwing the cloak over them. And so the cloak you see in that scene where they throw it over Grip Hook is actually an all digital cloak, but you wouldn't know. But yet somebody had to spend hundreds of hours and thousands of pounds uh, putting this cloak, and because cloth is really hard to do digitally as well, if you didn't already know. Um, yeah, Crystal, we, <laughs> you don't want this then, but I think this is the last, this is the last one. So, uh, just to wrap up, there will be many more streams, because believe you me, Misha, if you could just close that picture and take us back to OBS. Mm -hmm. Just to tantalise you for what is to come, once Misha brings back up the camera. So, currently, oh, pants, that was annoying. I've got things falling out. We've got down to here from uh, the previous page, but we still have all this page to go, all this page to go, and all that page to go. And that is simply one day. And that was, you know, because there was lots of details on that day. And then there's the whole week that I went back. So believe you me, we will have more of these things and there are more details that I will share, more handouts, more props, more gifts uh, that I was given. If you want to, you know. Come back and hear all of it, because I want to hear all of it, should I show them this? Yes, so what this is, is at the end of the day, I was given literally a bag, like a big bag full of goodies, and they offered me more and I said no. Yes, I know, I said no, I didn't want to look greedy. But they gave me these bookmark um, uh, markers. I only used the Gryffindor one because I would like to pretend to think that I'm a Gryffindor. <laughs> I have a friend pleading with me to go to the Ren Fair. Well, you could. Is that now? Is it very fair now? Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> yes, maybe if we do have a book club, we can uh, use these, um, or Misha can use these, <laughs> for when she reads The Deathly Hallows. Yeah. So, yeah, there was plenty more for me to talk about. Feel free to ask me a couple of questions in Discord if you like, but I'll be saving most of it for the streams. I guess we'll probably do one a month. 
Um, oh, yeah, well, we can, well, we can see how it, it kind of depends on my work schedule, I guess, because I do have several projects outstanding that I do need to work on. I don't want to go, I want to stay with you guys. Well, <laughs> Misha is basically, this is her channel, this is her stream, I'm just no, a guest no, on no, it. It's just, it's just for people who want to watch it back as well. That's true. If you want to watch it back later, <coughs> there's a... And I think Ben's... Ben's... <laughs> my throat's okay, it just might hurt a little bit in the morning. But there is lots of fun stuff happening that we have not covered, and uh, it's really exciting. It was, it was a really fun experience. What a month! Well, we shall we shall see if we can do it. <laughs> this is too interesting. Well, I'm really glad that you think so, at least because I am better at popping into other people's streams. I am what I call a reactionary. I am better, and this is both creatively and as a person. I behave better feeding off of other people's conversations, other people's wit and ideas, I build on them. Oh, sorry. frozen again. It's just, yeah, sorry. Oops, please no, it's bear still with. Going. It's, it's going. still going. But anyway, yeah, that's probably another reason why we should <laughs> Crystal, thank you very much. More than one a month would be better. Well, again, we'll see how it works out with uh, my work and also Misha's projects. I mean, Misha wants to show you what she's making for for you guys. So, um, thank you so much for listening to me. The stream is not over. Misha is going to continue to stream. It's just my part in it will be reduced. But essentially, I, I am more fun and bouncy and I was a bit sort of nervous and not sure what to do with myself at the beginning. For those of you who have stayed to the end, thank you so much. Uh, for those of you um, who haven't stayed to the end, you don't know what you're missing. So please spread the word because, wow, do I have a lot more stuff to share with you. So of course the Misha Show is amazing. Oh, and the fun thing I will share in one of the latest streams, I took one of Misha's hats to the set and Dolores Umbridge was there to see it. But we will save that story for another time. I've been Ben Ben. You've been awesome. Thank you so much. Here's Misha. Well, I'm not going to. I'm probably not going to stay on much longer. Though. Oh, Ben, quick question. Question away. I'm still here. Amazing, Ben Ben. Thank you for sharing with us. How did that video with the music turn out? That video with the music. Oh! Oh, uh, she's the one who shared the music with you. Believe it or not, to the L, there, I'm knocking things over. Um, uh, you're welcome, Mr. Jim, you're welcome. Um, essentially, I have purchased both tracks. I like them that much, and I've probably already listened to them 20 times each. Mm -hmm. I find them really evocative. Uh, uh, imaginatory storing, uh, stirring, like it stirs up my imagination. And uh, I will be using both. I'll be using The Sky Is My Kingdom, which I think is a really beautiful title, um, for the first half. Uh, I'm just trimming up a few seconds at the start. And also the coda at the end, I'm just going to trim that off. And then I'm going to transition into Suns and Stars. But I think the thumbnail for that track is absolutely beautiful as well. Be beautifully named. I can just picture time lapses happening and seeing the Milky Way moving. But I'll be using that, and I have a narrative in my mind, I'm going to be using both. And because it says that you can use them on YouTube, they just want you to link the video, the, the, sorry, the links to their stores. I'm going to do that. So I'm going to be using both of those tracks. Uh, I think it will work out really well in my mind. Hopefully the client agrees when they see it. If they don't think it's overkill, because it's quite dramatic. But I want it to be emotional because it's a 50th anniversary video. It deserves some chops, it deserves some emotion. So thank you so much for pulling me up. I may uh, continue to um, find more of their music over the course of this, the, uh, the year as I look for more fun music to use. So thank you. <laughs> that was a very long answer to your question. <laughs> oh, I'm really glad I was able to see this before work, Kenny. Just in time. Woo! Proud of self. <laughs> well, see, the thing is, I have, I have a whole catalogue of royalty for music that I have and different collects of different styles and flavours and it's quite hard to find good quality music that doesn't just have a good bounce or a beat but one that actually has quality sounding instruments and samples and that can tell a narrative that isn't repetitively boring after the first 20 seconds and really slow motion has a great depth to it yeah you both so much you're welcome go watch the start 
tomorrow's the same as most of it. Yes, go back and watch what you missed. Regina, the beginning Regina. is perhaps a bit rusty. It takes me a little bit to get going. But <laughs> it waffles a bit, but he gets going. Uh, it waffles. <laughs> I think it shows, because people would ask me, how did you get involved? Why? And I guess I just, I get verbose. Word of the day, verbose. <laughs> Right, do you want to put your books back? Okay. Your wand. Here's uh, Lita's, Lita's little Harry Potter dragon who's been hanging out this whole time. <clears throat> At the end of every Harry Potter stream, before I hand her back to Misha, I should say this. Mischief managed. 